Nej, den är inte inlagd, utan det är bara de. Uh, det tar rätt lång tid. Hör du något ljud? Jag går och ställer mig framför kameran. Jag ska se vilken kamera som är ute förresten. Det är, och det är den där, nu ska vi se. Jävla tillverkat här. Jag har bara kameramicken igång. Nu står jag mitt framför här i extrem ofokus kan jag tänka mig. Bapapapapapam. Nu ska jag se, jag går fram här snart. Du ser, det står i sidan där. Nu ska vi vilja... Nu går jag fram då. Nu ska vi se. Ja. Funkar. Fan vad bra. Tack för det här. Ja, jag har det ju bra. Mm. Och där babblade jag på lite. Eller hur? Mm. Ja. Ja. Här, fan, fan vad bra. Ja. Till sin stora glädje. Då vet jag att det rullar och det känns bra. Och jag, är jag ville vara här i tid liksom. Det var ingen det att jag tänkte att jag hoppar in där och ser ja, så ska vi se. Ja, det är väldigt, väldigt Nej, nu får du rulla på. Och det är inte så att någon sån här stopp ja. att du stänger av sig. Tio minuter. Så kan det dyka upp egentligen. Ja,
när vill du att det här bildspelet ska gå? Ja, så här att jag vill att det ska börja en bit in när jag kommer komma igång. Eller jag vet att för någon någon måste starta. starta. Ja, precis. Du måste fram och starta datorn. Kommer jag stå här? Jag det beror på vad du väljer, alltså, så att säga. Mm. Du, det är menar att du ska ha en plats där borta, men sen om du har ett bildspel och kanske någon presentation du pratar till, då är det väl bättre att du går hit och sätter ja. Ja. Jag ställer det menar jag. Ja, för då, om jag måste styra den här ifrån. Ja, jag menar det. Så det är ja, mera... för den ska inte komma igång. Den, jag behöver sätta igång den efter ett tag, annars fattar ingen någonting. Nej. Vad är själva bildspelet handlar om den? Ja. Men vi kan... Om du startar upp där ska vi prova att vi bara har kontakt. Jag ska ta fram stickan här också så att sätta bilden och dit. Nu kan jag inte skriva på min, jag kan inte skriva på min dator heller. Jag tänkte att man skulle anteckna under tiden hon pratar. Här ska det något bildspel som ska komma in. Sen är det så här va, ska vi se, det finns en, en, en videosvitch här va, ja. trycker jag på två andra skärmar så här, där har vi den, ja. då är det så, eh, när du kommer fram här, ja. då kommer antagligen den där ligga på, på ettan, mm. och då trycker du bara på den här ett snabbt hand, så där, så, då kommer den alldeles strax där, ja. sen kan man, för, ja är det någonting annars kommer jag springa där, ja precis. Men då har vi den. Då får den vara igång. Och sen, för sen jag trycker i början. Ja, för sen ja. börjar bilderna rulla. Nämligen. Ja, precis. Ja. Eh, behöver du peka så har du en, en laser. Det behöver jag inte. Nej, men den får ligga där då. Eh, då tänkte jag i sådana fall, eftersom du står här så håller vi oss till den här mikrofonen då. Ja. Ja, bra. Eh, då ska vi bara se här om de eller då. Presentationen också. Well, it's a pleasure for me, uh, on behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy, to wish you all welcome to the Gordon Goodman Memorial Lecture of 2015. And uh, I welcome, in particular, the Gordon Goodman Lecture, Professor Lawrence Tubiana, 
chief negotiator and French ambassador for the climate negotiations and also the other participants at the seminar that will follow the lecture. It's also uh, an honor to have Ambassador Lapouche here in the audience. Welcome. As most of you know, uh, Gordon Goodman became in 1977 the founding director of the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics here at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences that today is a leading institute of international reputation. Earlier than most, Goodman realized uh, the political importance of the climate issue. And together with the late Bat Bullin, an uh, academy member, he organized a series of meetings which led to the establishment of the IPCC in the mid-1980s. And in 1989, the Swedish government set up a new environment developmental agency, the Stockholm Environment Institute, and Goodman became its first leader. Therefore, it's quite natural that SCEI and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences together host this event. Our academy has, during the years, at least that I can oversee, been highly active on issues related to global sustainability and climate change. The academy is, for example, the host for the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, IGBP, the work of which has contributed to the success of IPCC. IGBP will now close, at, actually at the end of this year, but I'm happy that the Academy has contributed to the establishment of a Swedish hub that is part of the Global Future Earth Secretariat. And that secretariat also includes a hub in Paris. Future Earth will replace IGBP and the, the other global ICSU programs, and I firmly believe that Future Earth will be providing scientific evidence is needed for future IPCC reports and also, hopefully, future, helping future climate negotiations. Uh, the Academy has uh, several highlights when it comes to global sustainability, and for me personally, it was the third uh, Nobel Laureate Symposium on Global Sustainability that was held here a couple of years ago, and uh, that brought together uh, 20 Nobel Laureates, uh, all as well as leading experts on sustainable development. And, and at the end of the, of the symposium, a memorandum was signed by all the key Nobel laureates and handed over to the high-level panel on global sustainability appointed by the UN Secretary General. And, and uh, it's a very important meeting between science and, and, and politicians and negotiators, and I think it was important. A month ago, the Academy published an update on the scientific basis of climate change uh, and an update of the IPCC report. And as late as last week, and some of you who are here today, a workshop was held here at the Academy on Global Sustainability, Religion and Values. So we are looking forward today to hear about the road to Paris and negotiations. And by this, I leave the word to Ambassador Bo Chelen, who for many years has been Sweden's leading, leading climate negotiator. He has led Swedish delegations to UN climate change negotiations from the start until his retirement. And now Bo is currently uh, uh, an associate of the Swedish Environmental Institute. So Bo. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, and uh, welcome to all here. And uh, a particular welcome to Ambassador Jacques Lapouge, who um, uh, has already had a seminar together with SCI today and the uh, uh, Engineering Academy of Sciences which on uh, adaptation. I would say that for me it's a great set personal satisfaction to have this have had this close cooperation with France and the French Embassy here on these two events. And um, it is only natural then that we have uh, uh, Laurence Tubiana uh, with all Ambassador for Climate Change and the Special Representative of the Prime Minister 
of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France with regard to the uh, Paris conference in this autumn. Actually, um, I have known uh, Laurence Tibiana before we have been negotiating together on sustainable development, and it's a great pleasure for me personally also to see her here. Um, since uh, uh, I mentioned sustainable development, I think that uh, together with uh, the uh, climate meeting in Paris in, in uh, December, the uh, uh, meeting in, in New York in, in September on sustainable development goals also marks that this is an extremely important year in the uh, international cooperation on environment and sustainable development. Um, the program uh, is before you. There will be a number of discussions. But first of all, I would like to uh, ask Laurence Tibiana to uh, uh, take the floor for her uh, Gordon Goodman Memorial Lecture. I am, and I think we all are, very happy to see you here. I managed in Bonn last week to get into a room where you were speaking. Uh, I know that you have had so many different uh, assignments over the last year and will continue until uh, and after the, Re the uh, Paris conference. But uh, we are very happy to see you here in Stockholm now. So welcome, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very happy and honored to have been invited to give this lecture now a little less than six months before Paris. And uh, I thank you all, in particular, Bo Kielen, who has asked and insisted that I could come. And it's a, it's a pleasure just to stop from this uh, very, <clears throat> very demanding process, not always rewarding process, to be here with having a more peaceful and uh, thoughtful, I'm sure, uh, interaction than one I normally do these days. I wanted to share with you some elements of how we see and uh, based on what kind of expectation uh, the Paris Agreement could look and uh, why we are trying to develop a vision of a more global outcomes than the, the agreement itself. And that's why I, I wanted to explain you today. Just to come back to the idea that um, this process is, a, as we said this morning, is a complex process because it's trying to solve and to respond to uh, an extraordinarily challenging issue, which is a product of a billion of people activities, uh, the second industrial revolution's outcomes, and, uh, and uh, in a way, the core, uh, the core itself of the development pathway for the past century. So <clears throat> it's not simple. And uh, most of the time, of course, people don't understand why we are so long to create a framework to address that. But just I think it's good to remind us that it is very difficult. I have sometimes a comparison in time. When you look at the trade negotiation, it took uh, more, it took since 1948 until 1994, <clears throat> that's 50 years, to agree on something which is far more simple than uh, addressing the issue of climate change. Uh, discussing about the trade liberalization, meaning to lower the, um, the barriers to trade, 
uh, and even not all, but some of them only, and just to to have a, a, just a reform of the border tax, and uh, is something uh, normally much more much easier. But it still took 50 years to have a broader agreement. So when we started this in 1992 only, and of course we are already uh, uh, <clears throat> not totally, of course, going, going at full speed, I must say, but still uh, we have to understand that it is a very complex. And that's why this convention uh, of 1992, this climate regime, has been trying to respond to a, a number of difficulties and failures and has proved an enormous dynamism. Uh, the, the length of the process, the difficulties, is in a way hiding uh, whatever the, the deep changes and the deep process of essays and errors that has characterized this, this regime. And it is a profoundly evolving regime over time. And we, when we see all the sort of the main milestones since Kyoto in 1997, where Kyoto was all about timetables time and targets, <clears throat> sometimes uh, described as a to totally top-down exercise, which was not re really the case, but nevertheless, it was portrayed like that. Uh, and when you see uh, the, the, tr the different, of course, the difficulties of Kyoto to, to have everybody on board, and the, the attempt in Copenhagen later, um, and the different aspects that were finally finalized in Cancun, uh, in particular, this notion that the developing countries could put NAM as nationally appropriate measures on the table, transform, and, and in Cancun, again, the prospect of having a legally binding agreement was absolutely uh, out uh, of the table, and then came back, even in Cancun, uh, as an attempt, and finala, finally uh, uh, took part in Durban platform, uh, with this idea we need one. We need not only a commitment from countries on a voluntary basis, we need more than that. We need a framework. We need a more centralized framework to, to achieve that. <coughs> and that's what, in a way, uh, has le led to Paris. So anyway, we are constantly adjusting this process to try to respond to the challenges to encompass the complexity. <clears throat> and in a way where we are there is to try to go from a deep and narrow agreement, which was supposedly, again, it's a simplification to be the Kyoto style, to a shallow and large one, which is trying to, of course, less, have less of a profound commitments, in particular in the legally binding form of these commitments, but have everybody on board. And so we had finally a very classical evolution of many treaties, with the view that because it's climate change and because greenhouse gases are a global problem, a, a common pool resource problem, uh, we have to have, of course, at least a base of a very large agreement, even if we can go on certain aspects and certain sectors, uh, probably a sort of a more narrow and, uh, and more deep one. <clears throat> this uh, figure is uh, what has been in a QN and a David Victor paper, I think in 2009, uh, representing, uh, I think, something which was very useful for me when we decided to, to design the strategy for the Paris Agreement. And in particular, when you look at, the, uh, of course, what is, uh, if we think that finally addressing climate change is a product of many, many action and many, many elements, the notion that uh, we have a regime complex more than an agreement which is only as a central mechanism that can really modify whole behaviors, <clears throat> I think this notion that in, finally uh, the, the regime is complex and is uh, constituted by different elements and you have to work on all these elements. Of course, these figures of 2009 is, uh, should be now, now different because we have many more elements in there. Uh, but the interest was just to show that uh, not only UNFCCC, which is in the upper right, but as well IPCC is embedded in the regime. Uh, there are, of course, the action of uh, agencies, but the action of local authorities, multilateral development banks, etc. And that even there, you can find that it's a club of countries who are doing, and, and now more and more, it's a club of companies or a club of cities. So this notion that the regime is complex, <clears throat> again, was very useful for me to design what could be the outcome of Paris. 
If we don't believe in miracles, which will not happen in climate change, and, and of course I will make this available for everybody, and it's a famous paper of Victor and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Kion, who is quite, at least the figure is very useful, the paper is good, but the figure is particularly useful. <clears throat> and if we don't believe in miracles and one text, one legal text can do everything, which is not the case, there is no the evidence that the legal agreement and internal treaty will modify behaviors of billions of people. So we have to understand the result, the outcome of Paris as something if we want to be serious and really to uh, produce a shift in the expectation in the, for, for the future. So we have to work at these, at these different levels and the concept of Paris outcome is exactly based on that. So the rationale behind the Paris Agreement is uh, clearly building on the theory of rational expectation, which is in this house, would not be surprising. Uh, so, uh, Swedish economists have, uh, have been really active on this front. And <clears throat> so the idea is to think about that, how we can modify the expectation so to modify behaviors. And these are different behaviors, investors' behaviors, don't obey to the same incentive and, and don't respond the same than, I don't know, uh, developers in, in urban planning or whatever. So the notion that we have to work on this, and we have to work on all the elements of the climate regime, having a broad conception of this regime, and to try in all of these elements to make the expectation of every of these opinion leaders or actors or principles, if we would use this, um, sort of this concept uh, borrowed from economics, all these principles have to you know, share the same expectation, that the way we think the change can happen, not because a legal treaty will decide it, because everybody would think that this will happen. So it is very much relying on the fact that a self-fulfilling prophecy will make the job. So how you create this, of course, is another story, but that's behind the Paris uh, outcome uh, that has I try I propose to the French government and apparently they just accept that. So what is at stake in 2015? It's simple in a way. It's about changing economic and political signals in favor of the low carbon economy. And it's about the alignment of expectation of government, local authorities, businesses, consumers and citizens. So uh, on the 12th of December, the formula of the success of Paris could be this one, expectation of change. Most of people, 50, I don't know what the threshold should be, believe that this, this will happen. So, of course, this doesn't mean that it is simple to do. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes I use a metaphor, uh, it is uh, like a sheepdog, in a way it's like a, to... to push people and countries and everybody from, from behind to say that's the direction you have to go to, or at the same time like the magic float, that how you attract people to go in that direction. But the notion, but basically because we lost, we don't have, we never had by the way, the notion of the centralized emission of the signal have disappeared together with the timetable and targets in particular. Uh, including a global carbon price. I put that in black because I feel that in many of my colleagues in universities believe that we should go back to this. This is so much cleaner, simpler, and more, and more nice in a way. If we could have one central signal and everything would align around this signal, that would be so good. It cannot happen uh, once because many countries don't want that and, and many, many, many other reasons I would not delight. But so as we don't have this, we have to produce the signals in different areas and, with, and uh, attracting different actors which don't respond again to the same incentives. So that's why we describe uh, the Paris Alliance for Climate Action around based on this looking for uh, converging expectation and, and making this signal appear in different areas of the complex climate regime that we should have a legally binding agreement, by the way, that the mandate France has received from the Durban platform, so we have to deliver that. That's what we are, in a way, paid for, or we pay for, depending on you, the way you see that. It's quite expensive, by the way. I, I should not recommend any country to do that again. <coughs> we, we, of course, we have, and, and for me, it's separate, because that's the, con the group of what the countries are decided to put forward for this first phase 
for 2015, which we call the intended nationally determined contributions. We have to have a financial signal, uh, which is both respond to, to um, the commitment of 100 billion per year in 20, by 2020 that was promised in Cancun, <clears throat> but moreover to look for a post-2020 vision, which is how the financial system respond to the financial necessity of uh, the transition to this low carbon economy. And we added a, another area, which we call now the Lima Paris Action Agenda or Solution Agenda, which is a capacity to capture <coughs> the commitments, meaning the plans and the expectation of uh, a number of non-state actors, non-parties to the agreement, but will make a big difference for the agreement itself. And these four elements, of course, is a simplification from the complex climate regime I presented to you, uh, will be, in a way, the outcome of Paris. So four elements uh, to simplify, again, uh, what we are looking for. And uh, there are, of course, uh, these four elements, and the, they have, of course, a huge linkage. Um, the, depending on the rule we decide on the legally binding agreement, the contribution would be rather different. Uh, you may know that we have had in Lima a long discussion about the inclusion of adaptation of what we call in our jargon the mean of implementation, meaning finance in particular and technology in the contribution of the countries, whereas some countries were insisting on the mitigation aspect of these INDCs. So there are, of course, linkages between finance and INDCs, uh, between the rules in the legally binding agreement and this contribution and of course on the capacity of government to be more optimistic about their capacity to deliver. And this is very much related to the Lima Paris Action Agenda itself, meaning the capacity of businesses and uh, local authorities to engage and to demonstrate they believe that this will happen and not, and re relatively with reasonable cost. So if we just think that all this, we have to think broadly, but then we have to find something in common between all these elements. And in a way, like for every type of institutional arrangement, and in particular international institutional arrangement, we are in a way looking to these six points, which are classical in environment governance. We should find that in each of these elements, you have a consistency, coherence, and that we don't have trade-offs and contradiction between all the elements, or at least uh, diminish these trade-offs. Accountability, uh, if we again work on the global climate regime concept, uh, government are not the only ones who should be accountable, so we have to find some way, a way to create this accountability, for, in particular for non-governmental organizations and publics. We have to look for effectiveness, it's, it's not worth working to a very complex agreement if it doesn't deliver. So it has to really be useful and limited to what is useful and not uh, just for the sake of having an agreement. It has, of course, a huge element of reduced uncertainty, which is basically the reason why many act actors are doubting on their capacity to deliver climate action. Sustainability, which is, I think, something that is coming on and, and it's good that you, don't, you cannot think uh, the transformation of society through climate lens. You have to think more broadly to what sustainability is about, which is the way of development. And in a way, an epistemic quality, meaning that you cannot just ignore science. And that's a very important element, because many times in this process, we have had, of course, a strong contribution of IPCC. That will be the case in every step, and every step forward from this process is linked to, in, way, in a way or another, to IPCC report. But then we have to look for, in this particular uh, important on this long-term goal, which I will come back immediately in, in a minute, uh, what is consistent with scientific knowledge. We just cannot ignore this. And many times, of course, in the process, we have the scientific knowledge on the side and just proceed without referring to it. So, that, in a way, is the elements we are looking for in each of the component of the climate regime we are trying to push forward. <clears throat> um, I just want to characterize what we think should be, and somebody, I think, uh, a journalist uh, asked me uh, earlier on, 
what is really important for you in the Paris Agreement? And I could describe that this is these four elements, uh, of, of five elements. In the legally binding agreement, we are looking for rules or commitments, uh, but we are really, uh, it is a process to build rules that are here to stay. So the, the idea that this agreement is not uh, for 10 years, but it has to define the rules for on a longer term, and uh, that rules are to be uh, the binding element are, are to be the rules. The commitments themselves, it's that the numbers that countries are putting forward, uh, should not probably be the, the embedded in the agreement, but yes, the rules and the commitment to implement. So I think that is a very important element of the uh, bindingness in a way. This agreement has to refer to a long-term goal and uh, to move from a timetable and targets we had in the Kyoto thinking to something that it is more a decarbonization pathways. And you saw that progressively we try to adapt this language uh, in the discussion. <clears throat> Since Cancun, by the way, we try to adapt this language of the low carbon economy pathways. Uh, now we are just trying to, to look at it in a different way, to try to characterize what it is about decarbonization, in particular the energy system. And uh, we, we got in the G7 some kind of recognition that we, we have this long-term goal is not about an abstract figure of temperature, it's about doing something effectively about <coughs> uh, uh, energy in particular. So the long-term goal and the pathways notion, more than the timetable and targets, uh, is, uh, of course, a very important element. Then, um, in this agreement, we have to have some kind of revision mechanisms, uh, because that we know that, that the contribution, is the initial contribution would not make it, and we have to upgrade, up update this contribution over time. We have to have somehow the relation between science and the delivery of the contributions, and to have a review of adequacy, at least an adequacy of commitment for the next phase, if we cannot, for political reason, uh, produce a review on adequacy of achieved performance. Uh, and then we have to have, as well, um, um, a, a transparency systems that create confidence that uh, no, nobody's cheating or not cheating too much, in my message. So that, that are really the I don't see the minimum because I don't, I don't know what will be the minimum, hopefully. But I think that's the central, the core. That makes sense for the agreement in Paris. And I'm certainly forgetting very important elements. I haven't just point on mitigation, or adaptation, on finance or technology to try in a way the concrete expression. But this should be the core of the system to last. <clears throat> of course, on the contribution side, uh, we would like to have them uh, as many as possible. And uh, I, I, I didn't copy the good uh, formula that I didn't got the right example of my PVP, but I, I could come back to that later. So the, the idea on the contribution is really to shift from a logic of targets to a logic of pathways. And in this aspect, um, we try to accommodate the notion that uh, under the logic of pathways, countries have to think to their long-term pathways. And, uh, and they have to be, of course, combined with multi-time frame target packages as well with operational multi-sector. But uh, this idea that you have to think about the long term and not only on the first period, which is what, what is now on the table for 2025 or 2030, that is the way I think uh, we should, in a way, change the narrative. And it, it's coming, I think, to come. I, I now see countries like US or China happy to go with this uh, uh, pathway discussion. And uh, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, the, the Chinese leaders of the negotiation can say this agreement is there to support and develop uh, the, the low carbon pathway for all the economies at world level. So this notion of pathways of transition is now coming in in the process. I wanted just to revise with you uh, uh, where we are in geopolitical terms. And this is borrowed from a, a presentation from a EU Commission on the way they stated the state of the play, if I may say so, uh, of the different countries and the different group of negotiation. 
Uh, <clears throat> the first element on the legal form and the firewall mean the firewall for those who are not, fortunately for them, uh, in this discussion since many, many years, meaning there is a difference, uh, a structural difference between the commitments of developed countries and developing countries. That's why we, that's, that we call the firewall. <clears throat> and uh, and in, of course, it's normally uh, take its major expression in the legal form. And so <clears throat> you see that on the legal form, the one who want the lesser legally binding elements in the agreement, you see that US and China uh, and some are on this side, uh, and, and MDCs, I think, yes? Yes, and Arab, country, Arab countries in particular would like really to have a very soft agreement with mainly voluntary commitments and no more than that. Whereas uh, EU, uh, less developed countries, AUSIS, ILAC, RATIS, Latin, some, a group of Latin American countries, ALBA, which is another group of Latin American countries, want a strong legally binding rules. On this differentiation between developing countries and developed countries, of course, the weak, the weak differentiation, uh, <clears throat> with not so much surprise, comes on the US and EU side. And uh, ILAC and China are really in, 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 in the middle, in between, whereas LMDCs, which regroup a number of uh, developing countries, uh, middle-income developing countries mostly, there are some less developing countries in the group, uh, but more sort of, uh, they, they, that is their key point, that difference between developing and develop, and they want to keep the, the firewall intact. Uh, <clears throat> but Africa, houses, and uh, less developing countries are still uh, very keen to this differentiation. Uh, on the mitigation uh, element, you see that, of course, a strong participation to reduce emission comes from the developed country side, mainly uh, EU, uh, US, uh, I see, uh, Singapore uh, are, are on this, uh, on this uh, element. China and LMDCs, of course, would like to take the less possible, even if China is somehow in the middle, and uh, how this and uh, um, uh, less developed countries are the middle, meaning not because uh, anybody asked to less developed countries to take any any strong commitments, but because they insist probably sometimes more on adaptation than on mitigation for, in a way, something some, somehow surprising as a result. On the uh, ambition cycle, uh, China is certainly the more hostile to have a revision and, uh, of mechanism whereas the other ones are much more in favor of having a very strong, regular, every five years, uh, ratcheting up mechanism. And on transparency and rules, finally, um, of course, uh, you see that there is a big group in the middle and, and quite different of LMDCs, US, LDCs, and AOZ, small island, whereas the, the, the ones who are for stronger rules, South Africa, Brazil, EU, and Aussies are, are really on that side, whereas China and, uh, and uh, others are, are really wanting to have uh, the lesser, the more, the weaker rules in terms of transparency because of the uh, issues about sovereignty. <clears throat> and on adaptation, you see that finally there is a majority of countries now that are in favor of having a strong dimension of adaptation in the agreement. Uh, Africa, AUSIS, LMDCs, China are all in favor. Uh, whether uh, US and uh, EU are more careful because they would like, nevertheless, to have the agreement focusing uh, on uh, mitigation first. Where loss and damages, which is this, uh, not liability, but the problem of solidarity with the uh, victims of impact of climate change, uh, US and EU are more, uh, doesn't want to have this strong in the agreement. Uh, they would like to have as a separate point uh, for the core, whereas LDCs and AUSIS, of course, these are strong points. So that are the main elements. And on climate finance, uh, the, uh, the group of developing countries is in majority is insisting on public finance, on the level of finance, whereas US and EU being in the middle, 
uh, where as market finance through fi finance through markets, uh, EU and China being the more advanced, I think US doesn't have a strong position on that for evident reasons because they are not prepared to buy anything outside, whereas EU is prepared and China wants markets to be there. Um, uh, houses, NMDCs and LDCs are not very, very, well, they are in the middle, they are not particularly against, not particularly for, whereas a, a group of countries, ALBA, is definitely against having market, anything about markets in the agreement. So we add to all this a pillar we call the Solution Action Agenda, which requires, of course, uh, a little bit of thinking because it's a type of one uh, together with some other institution uh, of the climate regime that uh, doesn't, will not be part of the agreement per se. They will not be part of the MRV cycle. Uh, they will not make commitments officially within the agreement. But still we would like to, to have these non-state, non-party actors accountable, effective, and developing in a way a, a big support for the agreement itself, its long-term goal, and, and the shift uh, this agreement is representing. So uh, we first try to establish for, to convince parties that there was, there was a value of having an action agenda as a common outcome. One, because it facilitates the implementation of the existing INDC. Why, why this? It's quite evident that many countries were uh, concerned about uh, the, that this action agenda was a way for developed countries in particular to escape their obligation. So there is, of course, a lot of tension there. Uh, if we count or if we consider action from uh, local authorities, from financial institutions, from businesses, this is not the way to escape from formal obligation of governments. So that's why we insisted on showing that this is a way to facilitate the implementation, potentially to increase over time the ambition of future INDCs because it will lower the cost of technologies, just because, take the very simple example of the green procurement policies of many cities at world level now that are putting in place, this create markets, this of course increase the technology supply and demand and supply and, and of course lowers the cost of technology. That will lower the cost of capital uh, and will of course generate higher political pressure, meaning it's more facilitative from the government action at domestic level. <clears throat> the, the second element was to send a strong signal that the transition to a low carbon economy is feasible, profitable, inevitable in a way that the self-fulfilling prophecy argument is in the way. And in a nutshell, shaping expectation of all these actors. And that will, of course, contribute in a, in a very high way to this, to this element. What, uh, who are the actors we are trying to mobilize and to try to make a template of all to record and to register all this, all this action? The subnational authorities, which have been very, very active, the more active, certainly, uh, since uh, well before, before Copenhagen. The businesses, which are now coming in much more forcefully, uh, but not, for example, avoiding totally greenwashing, far from it. Uh, investors, uh, and in particular, that's really the new one. The, the banks, the institutional investors, the credit rating agencies, uh, the insurance companies uh, are coming now, and, and now uh, I would say the multilateral development banks, uh, largely because we ask them to come forward, and, uh, and they are coming forward, in particular by October, they will come with their plan to increase climate finance. <clears throat> there was a launch in uh, September, as you know, in New York, based on the uh, long-term action of many actors uh, on uh, some companies and some local authorities to develop uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, international public-private partnership, uh, an NGO, uh, uh, which really has uh, been quite active in pushing or supporting some uh, of this, in particular to try to 
make accountable this engagement of non-state actors and to review. And you see now these days, they, for the moment, they, they lack a lot of quality, of uh, scientific quality, but a number of uh, reports you see to try to evaluate what is the real contribution of these actors. So uh, the NGOs are already playing a, a third-party role that I think is a good thing for the future with, of course, the condition that uh, there is really rigor in the analysis and the evaluation. <clears throat> so there is a political rationale to encourage na nation state to do more. Uh, that's what the sort of modifying the political economy that, of course, behind this is, is the main rationale to do that. And, um, and the, substantial, the substantive rationale is to catalyze concrete action on the ground which I think will give uh, many, there is a learning process out there, and, uh, and of course this has to be uh, developed. So, and uh, I can take example, I don't have so much time, but uh, we then develop a, a template for business um, to uh, really uh, um, to explain that, uh, and, and that of course are the key messages we wanted to have out of this action agenda that it is not a sideshow, which still was the case probably in New York. Uh, we want to create a virtual circle of increased ambition. Uh, we see that the financial, which are the philanthropies, have a strong role to play to support leaders of different initiatives. And um, the road to Paris um, is not so much imp so important, but the road from Paris, of course, is even more important, and we need to be well prepared. Now, of course, the question will be how we inscribe uh, this commitment in the, when, when I go back to the climate regime uh, figure I had in the beginning, and I will end there, how we inscribe this in the uh, agreement? Do we make a formal relation between all these elements and the agreement? And it is very important. How we, for example, capture what the MD, MDBs, thank you, what the MDBs would do? Uh, can we have a registry where the local authority or the region of the businesses will put their uh, uh, commitments? Should we have a, a body that revise these commitments? Um, can we ask them to sign up the agreement to the, object, the general objective of these agreements? Can we have, a, I take the example, for example, the um, um, aviation issue. We, we still, we try to regulate it, you know, to try to put a carbon price on the emission. We fail on the EU level, but they take then a voluntary commitment of halving by 50% their emission by 2050. Uh, meaning what? Uh, where do we put these uh, commitments? Who is controlling it? And do we ask the aviation company to sign up to the agreement? Should we ask the companies to display a long-term pathway of emission reduction to have their low carbon economy pathways? Should we create club of countries that can, for example, try to discuss between them of a carbon price or uh, to uh, develop technologies together or to develop uh, deep decarbonization pathways? That's something that, on the, based on the minimum, which will be the agreement, will try to produce or to foster this club of front runners, just to try to see that over time we can do much more than we believe nowadays. And technology, of course, a key element of this, but not only that, uh, just uh, projecting, every type of actor has to project itself in its own capacity to what is the future and what a low carbon future represent for him in terms of the change in the activity, in the business model, in the way to behave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the type of thinking. Of course, I, I know we cannot develop all this by Paris, but we could at least create the framework where this behavior thinking scenario backcasting activities could take place in the future. And news, and that will be my final word, and sorry to have been so long, that these 15 minutes, these five years between 2015 and 2020, between the entry and to force of the agreement, would be, should be uh, taken as a fantastic opportunity to accelerate action and to put all this in place. So ideally, we will have this big picture in Paris. Ideally, we'll have the main rules. Ideally, we'll have this framework to have these new actors and this global vision to be inscribed in Paris 
and of course develop all the concrete elements afterwards. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think that when we started thinking about uh, this Gordon Goodman Memorial Lecture, and we thought that uh, it would be ideal to have uh, some cooperation with France on this presentation, and in particular to have you as the main speaker. Uh, I think we had an idea, at least I had an idea, that it would be exactly the kind of presentation that we have had now. And also it gives me a feeling of, of hope. I mean, we don't know exactly how Paris will really uh, develop in, in the le rest of the preparations and so on. But at least, I must say, I, I haven't heard any host country for any of the uh, meetings that we have had have a, such a coherent and logical view of what could be achieved and in what way one could best uh, put together all the various elements of a very complex reality. So um, um, it is not surprising, obviously, you know there are special links between uh, uh, Sweden and Descartes, and uh, the Cartesian spirit of France is there. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, because uh, this uh, presentation has captured so much of the reality and of the background for the negotiations, and I think it's the ideal background for the, pa the panel discussion that will follow now. So thank you very, very much. And now I'd like to um, invite Johan Kjölenskjärna, who is the director of SCI International, to have a brief talk with uh, Laurence Tubiana before the panel discussion starts. So would you please join Johan here, and you are very welcome to the rostrum as well. But here, please. I forgot the scenography. Huh? I forgot <laughs> the, I there will be a microphone coming up here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bo. And we will just have a short chat. And I will explain what will happen now is that uh, after this short chat, we will have a panel for really competent people who will come and give their perspectives also on the road to Paris from different perspectives after your excellent presentation. Then we will have a panel discussion and we actually have, you know, more or less an hour or even more than an hour for open discussions with you uh, here today. Uh, but also people following us on the live stream. Um, and you can also ask questions uh, and I will ask uh, one of my colleagues to try to follow. Uh, if you use the hashtag the only hashtag that is really relevant now, COP21, hashtag COP21. We will try to monitor that if there are questions coming up also to you uh, and also to the panel. But, I mean, just to follow up briefly a little bit, one thing, and this is a technical issue, uh, uh, Ambassador Tubiana, you are uh, ambassador uh, for the climate negotiations. Can you just very briefly explain what that role is? Actually, I mean, in, in, you know, France is the host as the government, and of course you have your ministers there who will be active, and the president is very active as well in his personal capacity. What is the role of you as, as an ambassador? Can you, are you really working together with nations now before the negotiations, and what exactly will be, be your role at the negotiations in uh, Paris? The, the ambassador for climate change uh, or, and the special representative is as a particular role compared to... Uh, sort of ambassador at large, is that I, I had the delegation of France, that's my first job, when the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, is not there, uh, I am the head of the delegation, or the Minister of Environment when it is French 
position mm. within EU, then uh, Ségolène Royal, the Minister of Environment, should be the head of delegation. When it is about the presidency, then it is Laurent Fabius who should be the head of delegation. And so I am here when he is not there. Meaning, so that's the official role. Uh, that I, I have to work with a team, which is of course a team within the administration, the French administration, coming from different ministries, working together. We are about now a little less than f f around 40 people working from treasury to uh, agriculture and environment and foreign affairs uh, people. And, <clears throat> and, and we are of course are actively working uh, until Paris. Mm. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, uh, I propose, when I arrived last May uh, to the French government, that we should work hand in hand with the Peruvian presidency. Peru took the presidency of COP20 COP on the first day, meaning us, I think it was the 1st of December, I don't remember exactly, and will be president officially until the 30th of November 2015. Uh, because we knew that uh, there was a lot to do, to be done, uh, we propose to the Peruvian that we start early as a presidency, so not waiting until May or June, which is a classical moment where presidencies shift, uh, but to work with them from the very beginning of 2015, but having them until the end of the year. It was, uh, in reality, more than a practical arrangement. It was a political arrangement as well. Because I think, and there is such a, a lot of mistrust, between developing countries and developed mm -hmm. countries, that to have a developing countries on the side, side or side or shoulder with shoulder, sh to shoulder with us, was the best way to convince that we were looking for a balanced outcome. Mm. And the third element was that it's so, so important to have a different perspective. And we see that every time. Every time we have to draft a paper, a background paper for an informal meeting, conclusions, decide how many countries we'll invite and how, uh, their, their perspective is different, huh? very different, mm. finally, and it's very interesting to balance that. So what are we doing from this January 2015? We invited several informal meetings to try to have that head of delegation level, we start the ministerial level in July, to try to see what are the landing zones of this, where can be the compromise. The, the character of this negotiation is probably everyone knows more or less where is the landing zone, more or less. That's not one point, and it's a landing zone. It's, it can be still large. But for the moment, all countries are keeping, holding their cards. So we don't negotiate, really, for the moment. We are waiting, I don't know what, for to negotiate, hopefully, uh, really, in, in August. So the job of the presidencies is to accelerate this process, this mindset, that we have to compromise, and we have to compromise early. The final element is we would like to avoid the Copenhagen scenario. The Copenhagen scenario um, arrived for many reasons. One was the text itself mm. was very difficult to produce by all the parties, and we arrived with more than 150 pages in the beginning of those two weeks in Copenhagen. So I understand the anxiety. Now I understand it very well. The anxiety of the presidency saying how we deal with that, what is the possibility. And we want to avoid that because we want to avoid to table a French text. We want to have a, a text that is largely, in totality, if possible, coming from the process. Mm. Of course, presidency has always to work at the final moment to finalize the agreement, but with a base that is known by everybody and everybody understand where the landing zone is. That's the type of work we are trying to do in parallel to the process in very good intelligence with the co-chair. So I've been long, but that's the explanation of what but I'm doing. But it's good to get that understanding of the different players and actors. I, I really appreciate also that you, how you have been working together with, with Peru as well. As you say, this north-south divide is still very uh, obvious. How long is the text now? You said, you know, in for, Par for Paris is 160 pages. Is it now a crisp 10-page document? No. Uh, no, <laughs> we don't yeah. have it. So the hope is that now uh, the co-chair of the group of negotiation, which now it's a north and south combination, a pair, uh, has had received a mandate in Bonn to write one, a paper. I hope it will be more con much more concise. This one is really awful, the one we have. 
and uh, and to have a clear and concise and more with a number a reduced number of options and then we can try to really start negotiating the substance in August but as you say I mean in, already in 2009 and, and you stressed it very much also that the climate the climate negotiations and when we talk about climate issues in general they, they are very complex they, they relate to so much in our society energy agriculture cities etc um, this complexity will it not be how will we overcome the complexity and, and thus also get a quite clear agreement in, in Paris? How do we deal with the, the complexity versus actually reaching a clear agreement? <clears throat> yeah, this, of course, depends on the degree of preparation of countries. It's improving. Since Copenhagen, it has improved immensely. Mm -hmm. It's not done, nevertheless, because when you look at... Uh, I had the conversation was a friend of mine, the Secretary General or Executive of the Commission, the Economic Commission from Latin America. And when she talked with governments that have been preparing their INDCs, she realized that for them it was many times a shock. It's something to say we will do something of, for climate change, but when it's different when you translate to transport policies, to the energy prices, to the energy mix, to the scenario. And when you begin to think about 2025 or 2030, which is the horizon that most developing countries have chosen, well, that's a projection you don't know, do every day. So there is really a technical, intellectual, political, economical difficulty. So I think that's why we have to be very clear on the rules without creating uh, enormous concern that uh, it's really be impossible to fulfill, that we have an evolving system that can go from uh, relatively low demand for a number of countries to higher demand over time. And that's a complexity. Clear, a clear system which is at the same time evolving is, is tricky. But we can include revision clause not to be able to, if we can't resolve everything, we can uh, include revision codes, we can try to indicate the main direction in the agreement and then to go more with more precision over time in the rules. So we can do a, a number of things to uh, create more cert mm. certainty, which is finally what the many countries are looking for. Just also to understand in terms of complexity, one issue that has been very challenging in, in negotiations before is how to deal with specific sectors, for instance, the, the agricultural sector, the water sector, etc., both in terms of mitigation but also adaptation. And to a certain degree, we have sort of kept sector discussions a little bit outside of the negotiations. I mean, in water, which is my own background, I know you sometimes you try to keep in, you know, international waters out of the discussion because they are also politically very... <laughs> yes, they are not helping uh, many uh, times. No, yeah. not so easy with the major rivers. How will you deal with that in Paris? Because there are also quite a lot of push to really get sectors in there, because adaptation and mitigation is very much linked to the, the key yeah, sectors. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one issue is that this uh, sort of uh, uh, this separation between, we discuss about commitments, which was very Kyoto-focused, and we don't discuss on policies, so there is a big divide into, uh, we discuss on numbers and uh, the countries do whatever they want, but they, it's not the business of any, anybody else, is now fading. And now the idea that you put forward your policies, and they are sectoral policies at the end of the day, mm. uh, I think is improving the picture. So it's not international policies you are discussing, you are discussing your own policy. Mm. It could be your own carbon price policy or your own transport policy. You are not discussing it with others, but you are just displaying the way you would implement your commitment. Meaning you create, which is happening already, um, a series of... Uh, communication of information between policies. And if I take other sectors I know uh, from my past studies or past ac academic activities, when you look at the exchange rate policies, for example, or a number of policies that were sometimes were conditional to, to funding, uh, but some, some were only the every country looking at everyone saying what is the best mm. and what I can borrow. And, and you know in the literature, in the academic literature, most of the convergence of policy didn't come through imposing, but come from, because countries are connected by geopolitical reasons for, or, or for trade reasons. And that is, I think, what will happen. Mm. We can have a convergence of policies on many issues, particularly uh, the share of renewables. It's clear that 
that's, I was commenting that, I think at lunch or previously, you see that most countries would have a sort of a target on renewable energy, which is relatively comparable. It's not because they have made a very serious study that if China do 23 or 25 percent or 20 by 2030, I should do the same. It's just because it begins to be a reasonable number and it appeared to be reasonable wisdom that you can do so much in your country. And this is, I think, focuses, focusing minds. So that's why the sectors are back to the discussion, but back in a way through domestic policies. And that, I think, is a, a very big benefit of this process. That's good. I mean, it was like Ambassador Linz that said this morning, it's a bottom-up approach coming into what was previously more of a top-down approach. So maybe that was actually one of the benefits of the Copenhagen conference. The, you, we needed also the bottom up. The final question before I let you rest a little bit and we have the panel and then we have the discussion also with the broader audience uh, after the panel. We have, I mean, the Paris meeting is actually the third meeting uh, this autumn following all, not just linked to climate change, but also we have the finance for development now in July uh, where governments will come together to broadly discuss uh, financial issues for broader development perspectives. We have um, the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, being hopefully uh, accepted in, in September in New York, the 17 goals on the table here. Um, and of course, a lot of us are saying there are linkages between these three, clearly. How, 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 how important is it? What would you like to see uh, in, in July and in September in, in a way that could actually provide positive inputs also to the process for Paris? Are there any specific sort of hopes or desires? <clears throat> of course. Apart from just falling apart, of course. But Yes, <laughs> first, not falling apart, it's a good condition. The second is um, to really, uh, because it's so important, we have had this discussion about sustainable development and it begin to crystallize. And I think even if um, some would say it's too many, 17 objectives, it's too many. Uh, but these goals are very important mm -hmm. because they just integrate very, very deeply all environment in de economic development and social development. So uh, I think the September meeting is really very helpful because it provides a framework mm -hmm. for the climate discussion. And uh, sometimes, of course, we can be negotiators, climate negotiators can be or tend to be a little narrow-minded. If it's not in the agreement, in the negotiation, they would not care so much. Huh? That's why it's difficult for them to address water issues or uh, we are talking about ocean these days. Huh? Uh, why ocean are or not in the agreement? For negotiators, it just are out. It's, it's a question of out. It's not because climate change is not important for ocean and ocean not important for climate change, but it's very difficult for them uh, they are really looking for this agreement to uh, reconsider other elements. That's why to have a framework of sustainable development as a, not only a chapeau, but something that really should determine what do we do for climate change in the context of sustainable development. And I think it will not be a phrase now, it will be something much more precise. So that's the big win, which I think is hopefully out there. On the financial for development, we are, of course, on a more tricky discussion because it's still about what is responsible for what. Can we have a climate finance additional to ODA, uh, which in many cases doesn't represent the reality because when you are financing clean energy, you are financing development and you are fin financing climate action as well. But that means only we have to have more public finance in the system and how much developed countries in particular are prepared to, how much this movement of developed countries would finally incentivize all the major economies to go on and to follow this path, still to be determined. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I hope we will get a, a rational and good result, a good framework in Addis. Um, but, of course, that's a more complicated part. Mm -hmm. So you're a bit more worried about the finance for development and more optimistic about exactly. the SDGs to provide that yeah, framework. Exactly. Thank you very much. There will be much more tricky question coming from the audience when we are in the panel. This was just a warm-up, so thank you very much. <laughs> now you can rest a little bit. Yes. Uh, and I will actually invite, uh, we have four speakers now who will provide different perspectives uh, uh, also on our route, on our way to, to Paris. 
And I'm very pleased to first of all uh, uh, introduce Michel Colombier. Uh, Michel, please join us. Uh, who is scientific director at the Institut du Développement Durable et de la Relation Internationale, IDRI, in, in Paris. Uh, I'm also very pleased that IDRI and SCI, together with a number of other European think tanks, are talking more how we can actually work together, not just on, on issues related to climate change in Paris, but also in broader terms. So, uh, Michel, I'm very pleased to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and participating in this uh, very interesting discussion. Um, well, I've been seven minutes, so I think I will focus on one point precisely, um, which is the following. Um, I think that for the people that are not on a daily manner involved in this negotiation, but also sometimes for the people within the negotiation, um, there's an apparent paradox or even contradiction in the way the discussion, the interna international discussion has evolved along the, 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 the recent years. On, on the one hand, um, since Copenhagen, we have managed to operationalize some of, some of the global objectives that we have defined in Rio. Uh, we have adopted this two-degree pathway, this two-degree objective, long-term objective. We are also trying to define a global adaptation objective. And at the same time, we are speaking more and more of a bottom-up approach. We have based this Paris Agreement on the presentation by countries of so-called INDCs, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. And there is a question out there, to what extent this bottom-up approach, these countries presenting their contributions, this is what I can do, etc., can really deliver what, on the other hand, we are defining as global common goals. And I think one of the quality of, maybe of Copenhagen was, a, I mean, Copenhagen was a failure, but maybe it was a creative failure, um, is that we have, I think, profoundly changed the paradigm of the negotiation, and that maybe for the first time since Rio, I think we are defining the challenge as a common challenge for all the countries that are present in this negotiation. And I'm trying to explain this in uh, six minutes now. Um, I think the first point that has really changed uh, is the fact that the problem and the solution has long been defined as an issue of cost. It, it would be a cost to change the way we relate to energy, to change the agriculture model, etc., etc. Yet a number of reports, since the Stern report, the New Climate Academy, etc., and others, have made us understand that it's not so much an issue of cost. It's an issue of investment, investment in a new economic model. But that this economic model, this different economic model, can be profitable to all, profitable to our countries, profitable to developing countries, and so the big issue is about the transition, how we, how we can manage this. Second, it's not just a matter of experts and reports, etc. It's a matter of experience. In the last decade, a large number of countries, and not only countries, but municipalities, regions, etc., private sector, have undertaken action. It's clearly not enough. I mean, if we look at the trends, we are far from what we need, obviously. But it is very important in the experience that all these people have gained, some driven just by political opposition, because in the US nothing was happening at federal level, they wanted to do something at regional level, at state level, etc. Others, because they understand that it's a challenge, because they, are, they think they are accountable to their citizens, because they think that they have maybe a competitive edge for their company in doing so, etc. The, the motivation doesn't, doesn't, is not very important. The fact is that a, an important number of people, constituencies, institutions, countries have, I think, learned a lot through this tentative action during the last decade. And we see this already, and Laurence has mentioned that, in preparing the INDCs, I can tell you no country certainly would have been able to present an INDC in such a in such a small period in time 10 years ago, because it really necessitates some understanding of what is possible what, at each sector, etc. the discussion you just had. So I think this is very valuable for the discussion, even if we have to recognize that, well, it's not sufficient. We cannot go as this. And the third point, and very important point, is that time has passed, and science also has evolved. And what we know today is that Eventually, but 
soon after the mid of the century, we need to be almost, I mean, we, we, we say carbon neutral, whatever it, whatever it means. Whatever it means, it means that for our energy systems, we need to be almost zero emission by the second half of the century. Not just us here in Europe, but every country around the world. And so every country around the world today, coming to these negotiations seriously, taking seriously into account the two degree objective, and I think that almost all countries are coming seriously. All country has to face the fact that being developed countries, developing countries, emerging countries or whatever, by the second half of the century, it needs to have adopted a low carbon economic model. And this is a very important shift to the previous way we were discussing. Because we've been discussing for years in trying to have this burden sharing approach, you know, we, we need to reduce. Starting from now, looking ahead, we need some reductions. Who would reduce? I, I can reduce a bit if you reduce a bit. If you reduce a bit more, I can reduce a bit more. I'm not reducing because it's too early. I have other priorities. I don't have the capacity, so you can reduce, etc. This, this discussion was leading nowhere, clearly. We are now, I think, in a very different position where every country should go to this negotiation table by saying, if I'm serious, I need to undertake that transition. And so my question in the negotiation is no more should I act or not, how much, etc. I am driven by my own necessity to drive a transition and drive it as smoothly as possible but as efficiently as possible. And my question to the negotiation is what can I take out of this negotiation to help me in a transition, to support my transition? So what is the collective value of this negotiation so the transition in my country will be possible, will be profitable for all my citizens, and will eventually be made in 30 years time, 40 years time, which is a very short period in time. And obviously we have very different challenges in our countries where we have all these assets locked in the carbon economy, physical assets, but not just physical assets, intellectual assets, uh, uh, capital assets, etc., etc in very rapidly growing uh, uh, countries where the issue is about these rapidly exploding cities and you need, to, you need to produce electricity more and more, etc. Are you able to put all this capacity at a speed that is tremendous speed? And developing countries where the challenge is still different, where the, country, the question is to what extent this new approach can support the development objective of the countries and also help them not to stay, I would say, on the side of this new profitable economy, which is very important. And I think this would be my last point. The, I think the negotiation now is really about, as Laurent said, if all countries are coming to the negotiation with this challenge in mind, the first question is really how we shape expectations for every agent, every citizen, every mayor, every private sector, etc., etc., that this is the new normal. And we have the responsibility, our countries, but also emerging countries, because we are defining the technology, we are defining, I would say, the investment trends, etc., to shape this new normal for other countries also. And then we have the big responsibility also to make it possible for the poorest countries of the world, not just out of solidarity or whatever, but because it is the only way for us also to make our action valuable, because we need their action if you want our action to eventually reach the two-degree the objective we have. Thank you. Thank you. I can just ask you one question so you warm up a little bit, you know, before, I, you know, it's, they, we warned the other panelists. You, 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 as you were saying, and I, I really liked what you said, Lorient Subiana, you call it logic of targets to log, logic of uh, pathways. I mean, this is what you're describing in a way. Don't focus so much on targets. We have to really have the pathways to a low-carbon economy. But still, also from your own experience and from Idris' experience, isn't there a risk still, if we are not managing this, that this is, this is seen again a little bit by many developing countries as a way for us to get out of really committing to, to, uh, you know, to serious cuts? I, well, I think that the, the issue about committing to pathways is not about France, for instance, saying I will emit 80% less in 2050. Mm -hmm. So the big issue is what is the consistency between short-term action and this long-term objective? And we see this in Europe, for instance. The way NGOs, the way stakeholders, etc., are discussing the, the proposal by the, the Council, etc., is not 
well, we are proposing minus 40, but compared with the Americans, etc. No, the way we are having a discussion is in mm. Europe is, well, we said we want to decarbonize Europe by 2050, but this 40% is not sufficient. The speed we are developing renewables, etc., is not consistent with our long-term goal. So I think it's not about committing to pathways. It's about committing to short-term action. That is, as far as we know, with, with information we have on science, on technologies, etc., etc., which is making it possible for this transformation eventually to mm. happen, which is completely different. So it's really about the short term. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me invite the next speaker, uh, Anna Lindstedt, Ambassador and Chief Negotiator of Sweden for Climate Change. You, you have the same title, but for Sweden, so Climate Ambassador. I don't know if there is a difference to be an ambassador for climate change in Sweden or in France, but I know that you are quite often also leading the Swedish delegations to the climate negotiations, and you were just coming back from Bonn also after two weeks. And again, also for this audience, I have to quote, I, I was sort of in contact with Anna over the weekend and asking her, can, I, you, know, can you tell me something about negotiations? And she said, moving forward, slowly. <laughs> that was every, the only thing she wanted to share. So let's see if she's going to share a little bit more now. So please, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I think there's a slight difference uh, between being a, an ambassador for climate change for Sweden and for France at this moment. Although we are doing our best, not just Sweden, but uh, all countries in the world to support Ambassador Tobiana in her very important role. I was ambassador to Mexico before taking up this position in, in 2011. And, and uh, I was following, I mean, I was um, holding the local presidency for the, for the EU uh, in Mexico in the run-up to Copenhagen where we had this this idea of this is, is it's now or never, this sort of there's no plan B. And our then um, Minister for the Environment, Andreas Kargren, is, is with us today. And, and, and I think what, what happened in the run up to, to Copenhagen and in Copenhagen was that we, we had these huge expectations that we would solve everything in one go. And, and what we came out with was actually not that bad, but it was this complete uh, disconnect between expectations and. and what was really achievable at the moment that, that, that made us so, uh, so disappointed. Uh, and I was following closely uh, Ambassador Tubianas, uh, um, a colleague in Mexico at the time, uh, uh, Luis Alfonso de Alba, who was picking up the pieces after Copenhagen and, and started to build trust uh, between all different countries in the world. And I think, uh, Laurence, you are doing that uh, in, a, in a similar way. Uh, so we are very confident in, in, in having you with us in, on this road to Paris. And uh, it's very good also to have Jacques Lapour uh, as ambassador to Sweden. We were colleagues in the negotiations beforehand. So uh, I think we are, we are doubly blessed uh, by having you here as well. Uh, and, and I, uh, Dr. Colombia, thought it was very interesting uh, what you said about uh, this is actually uh, we should be optimistic because these are opportunities. Uh, we have the Stern Report, we have the new climate economy, uh, actually an initiative uh, taken by, by Sweden to commission this report. So to, to, to put costs on the table but also show benefits of action because this is not just necessary for, for the world to, to move towards this uh, new uh, economy, uh, low carbon but also climate resilient. Uh, it's not just necessary, but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for our businesses. It's an opportunity uh, not just for, for, for people, but for our businesses. So to change the narrative, and, and we, in the EU we've, we've been looking at this burden sharing, how do we share costs? But we need to change that and, and see also opportunities. Uh, I, I really uh, admire your, your um, explanations, uh, Laurence, in, in, in framing this as, as very complex and, and also something that is just, not just what is happening under the UNFCCC, but all the multilateral institutions and, and bilateral, multilateral uh, cooperation, clubs. I think we need the clubs, uh, but it's not enough. We also need, we need to have this, uh, this new global fr framework. And I think it's, it will be the, the, the first truly uh, multilateral uh, agreement that is ap applicable to all. Uh, but we shouldn't be, I mean, be, 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 we shouldn't be disappointed, but 
with what we have achieved, because we have achieved a lot, and we always tend to see the, the glass as half empty rather than half full. I mean, considering it was very uh, relieving to get this, this analogy with, with uh, trade negotiations, uh, because we are not there yet, but we are on our way, and I think that's important to remind ourselves uh, about that. Um, the, the legal agreement that, that we need, of course, it's, 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 it's really imp important to, to, to give a signal, signal to countries, but to also to all kinds of stakeholders. And I see the, the, the legally binding agreement that we will reach in Paris as sort of a platform and as, communi as a communicating body with, with, other, uh, with other processes uh, so that we can inspire each other, so, uh, so to say. And it's important that we build a multilateral system that it's not just about reducing emissions, of course that's the core, but to do that we also need to have all these other uh, components, adaptation, means of implementation, not just finance, but of course finance is, is, is vital, but also uh, capacity building, technology transfer. Technology transfer is, 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 is a key. And, and to move towards this uh, finger pointing, you should do this, you, know, you should do it, this sort of catch-22 to a system whereby we cooperate, we facilitate things for each other. And it's a win-win, not just for developed countries and, 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 or developing countries, but for all of us. And to, to find a system where we can, we can not just punish and point fingers, but also facilitate and support, support each other. Uh, and I think, I mean, we've, we've moved towards a, a, a bottom-up system, but we also need to, to keep some top-down elements, obviously, to have legally binding rules and, and to, to be able to, to follow up and to, uh, to be transparent, to, to, to see and, and, and follow up actions that have been committed so that we can see that we're, we're, we're actually on, on, this right, on the right path. Um, and to find this, this very delicate balance uh, between what is, what is needed and ambitious enough and what is actually feasible, to be a little bit pragmatic. We know the limitations. We know the limitations of, of some countries uh, when, it terms to, when it comes to, to legally binding, to find the right kind of, of, of balance and, and find a solution whereby commitments and targets might not be legally binding per se, but to find the linkage between the legally binding core and the accompanying decisions that actually make them in practice legally binding also at an international level. I would like to finish by saying that we need to leave Paris with an agreement that is not just applicable to all, but also something that everyone can take to, our, to their heart and take home to their governments and say, this is something that we can really implement. implement. This is something that is doable. This is something that we can use for our domestic work, because we know that all countries, including Sweden and France and, and the developed countries, we have a, a, a delicate internal discussion also with different interests between our environment ministries and, and finance ministries and, 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 and uh, heads of government and, 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 and state. It's not, it's, not, it's not that straightforward for any of us. And there are countries that have an even more difficult balance. Let's take the, the oil producing countries. I mean, they've built all their economy on, on fossil fuel, on a, on a fossil fuel uh, dependence. Uh, and I think it was quite important when the Saudi Arabian minister said in, in Paris recently that we know that we cannot depend on, on fossil fuel forever. I mean, that was way ahead in the future, but I think it was a, an important signal. And probably the first time that, that a country like Saudi Arabia had said that in public. We know it in, in, I mean, in the bilaterals uh, we have uh, that that is the idea and they were building diversification but to say it in public. And, and I'm quite, optim quite optimistic because I know that uh, from bilateral talks with virtually all countries in the world, that all parties to the convention now want this agreement. We might not want exactly the same thing, but we want the agreement 
and we are all working, those who haven't presented their NDCs are all working on them. They might be a bit skeleton-like in the beginning, they might be quite rudimentary, but at least they will be, or the majority of countries will have presented their INDCs well before Paris, and they will then be filled with contact, content. But once again, an agreement that everyone can realistically implement with support, with different forms of cooperation, and all of us incentivizing each other to do more over time. Thank you. Anna, if you, one, one, just one more question for you as well. I, you, you, you have led um, uh, quite a lot of discussions around loss and damages. Uh, and I know these, these are particularly difficult uh, parts of the negotiations as well. Um, but they've shown some success uh, in, in the recent meetings. What has been really the triggers to try to get uh, countries in an area where there obviously are very strong conflicts to sort of get together and, and, and eventually uh, agree on a way forward? You're pointing at a very difficult issue that has been difficult for many, many years. Mm. We did manage, um, with, with a uh, facilitation by, by Sweden, to agree on an international mechanism in Warsaw in 2013. I think that was a landmark decision. Not an easy one to reach, but, and not enough for some countries, but at least a very important milestone. And then we know that there are countries that are eager to have this as, a, as, a, as an pillar of its own in the mm. agreement. And then there are some other countries who couldn't accept this at all. I think there is a, a landing ground in sight. Uh, it's about being pragmatic, build again, build on what we have. Uh, and also, one important par part of it, I mean, we, we, we have this whole issue of compensation in liability and liability, which is not really realistic uh, to, uh, to include in, 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 in the Paris Agreement. But it's also about recognition, it's about responsibility, and above all, it's about solidarity. Mm -hmm. So it's really, but still, I mean, it's building trust, obviously, that is a very important aspect yes. in all this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move to the third speaker, uh, Kenneth Kimmel. President of the Union of Concerned Scientists. It was interesting when I, when I had a chance to ask you because you know quite a lot of companies they're always saying, standing up and say, well, I'm I'm here representing my company. We are 150,000 people working, and and you should be, get impressed, of course. You know, you get impressed. And then I asked Kenneth, so Union of Concerned Scientists, you know, is, how big is that? Well, we have about 500,000 members in the U.S. mostly. So you know, then you get impressed. You know, so you are bigger than the biggest corporations in the world. So 500,000 very concerned scientists standing behind your back uh, ahead on the road to Paris. So please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to uh, be here. And it's those 500,000 members who allow us to punch above our weight. Um, thank you to the uh, Stockholm Environmental Institute and the Royal Ac Swedish Academy for having me. It's very uh, meaningful, actually, for me to be in this city. Uh, our founder, Dr. Henry Kendall, was here 25 years ago to receive a Nobel Prize in physics. And he founded UCS because he was very concerned about the fact that so many American scientists were working uh, for the Defense Department on military matters. And his vision was to put the best scientists in the country at work on the most pressing problems of our time, of course, including climate change. Um, from our perspective as an NGO, we look at Paris as uh, the best and perhaps the last chance to make a substantial down payment on our obligation to future generations. We feel that if we do that, historians will look at this uh, year as the pivotal turning point when we finally got serious about climate change. If the Paris Agreement fails, um, I think history will not judge us kindly. Um, here's what's the most important thing to us uh, about this agreement. Um, we look at it as a down payment. We agree with the other speakers that the uh, aggregate totals of reductions that we will be pledged will not be enough to get us to where we need to be. So recognizing that it is a down payment, um, we need a long-term goal uh, embedded in the agreement that's based on science and that galvanizes the attention of the world and sends an unmistakable signal that we're not talking about whether to decarbonize, we're just talking about 
how and when. Um, we also think it's critical that this agreement take into account the rapid, almost uh, blinding pace of change in the field of energy. Imagine, for example, if we had set targets in Copenhagen in 2009 based upon what we thought the price of solar and wind and, and natural gas would have been in 2009. Boy, would we be off in two, 2015, and boy, would we have underestimated our ability to make change. So I think this agreement somehow has to have a combination of long-term goals, but a flexible means that we can keep into a, take into account what's changing in the world. And so we are very partial to the idea of uh, the ratchet and review, the continuous cycle of improvement uh, that uh, Minister Tubiana talked about, and we think that's going to be an essential part of the, of the goal of the success of the agreement. Um, as the only uh, panelist from the U.S., let me comment on the U.S.'s pledge a little bit and what we see as some of the issues. Uh, we support uh, strongly President Obama's pledge of 26 to 28 percent. We think that is a credible pledge. We think that does increase uh, the United States' pace of decarbonization. Um, and probably the most important thing about it is that that pledge is actually based on regulations that are either in place right now or will be in place by the time the president leaves office. So it is not a hope, it's not a dream, it doesn't require some new law to get passed. It's, it's a reduction target that we think we can make based on existing law. But that being said, um, like other countries, we're going to need over time to increase our level of ambition. And this is where it gets hard because we are an incredibly divided country politically. Perhaps the best way to ex example I can give you, there was a resolution in the U.S. Senate a few months ago uh, about the Keystone Pipeline, and the resolution was whether the Senate agreed that climate change was real and humans were a significant cause of it. That resolution passed by a vote of 50 to 49, with only five members of the majority party voting in favor of it. So five out of 54 Republican senators said no to that resolution. And that tells you in a sentence just how difficult this is going to be. So we know that uh, our role is to build the political coalition for a larger majority so that we can get beyond the 26 to 28 percent. Um, and I'll be happy if people are interested at some point to talk about some of our theories on that. But let me just uh, finish by saying this. Um, I think the success of Paris uh, and the success of the United States are very, very linked. Uh, we, we need to, uh, in order for Paris to be successful, the United States, as such a large emitter, uh, needs to be part of that. But I would say, in order for the United States to grow beyond the 26 to 28 percent reduction, Paris needs to be a success because there are many people in the United States who would like an excuse not to do more. And the very best excuse we could hand them is, other countries are not on board, they're not doing their fair share, so why should we? So I, I, I think the United States uh, needs to be there for Paris, and Paris needs to be there for the United States as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth, and also thank you for, for sort of bringing up the perspective of the U.S. and the challenges you have there as well. I mean, in terms of what, what other speakers have said, there is a sense of optimism, and, and if I can interpret you correctly, there is also a sense of optimism from, from your side. Uh, President Obama has stepped up quite a lot. Um, well, how, how, how can we ensure that this is actually a longer term stepping up? I mean, Obama is in his second term. There tends to be a more ambitious president in the second term. Mm -hmm. What you're signaling in terms of, of the majority in, in, the, in Congress is a bit worrying. Uh, two years from now, is it very much depending on who the next, next president will be, or, or can we see a, a sort of a U.S. stepping up more, more generally? Well, I, I feel pretty confident that the things that the administration will put in place will stay in place, regardless of who the next president is. But I want to be honest, to get beyond that will require uh, national climate change legislation, which we don't have. Mm. Um, and that will depend in part upon who the next president is. Uh, but, but it's also one thing that's important to point out, a very good chance that the Senate 
will flip from Republican to Democrat in two years just because of the interesting math we have about our, about our politics. So um, I think what really is happening in the United States beyond the national level, though, are two very positive things. One is while there's paralysis at the national level, at the level of state and regional governments, there is not paralysis and there are some tremendous leaders mm -hmm. like Jerry Brown in California who's actually in some ways taking his state beyond what any nation has even pledged to do at this point. Um, there is also a very large uh, and committed uh, business sector. Um, uh, wind, wind developers, solar developers, uh, battery storage, there is a clean tech economy emerging in the United States which is becoming a powerful voice for these reforms. So I don't think it would be easy for an incoming president to derail what's already been done but there's a danger that we won't continue uh, to lead in this area depending upon how politics play out. And so it's incumbent upon groups like us to really change the conversation in the United States and build a political majority for change. Thank you. No, and I think we come back to that at least in the panel as well, because as you say, uh, the U.S. is not just any other country. There are a number of countries like U.S., China, Brazil, India, Russia, together with the European Union, of course, and others, who will be really important uh, if Paris will, should, or will succeed or not. So I, I'm sure we come back a little bit to understand more of the politics there. Thank you very much. Let's take the fourth and final speaker before we really get into the hardcore discussions with, with the audience. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Johanna Sandahl, chair of the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. You also have a fairly good uh, membership, don't you, in Sweden? How many yes. are you? Uh, 221,000. 221,000, okay. You are now, you are only scientists, you're a smaller group, but you know, 221,000 in a country of 9 million is not too bad. So, It's actually 2.3% of the Swedish population. You see? That's, <laughs> <laughs> you see. Okay, Johanna, the floor is yours. Okay, I don't think, I'm, I won't, I will use this in a while. There will come another, just a second. Yeah, but I, I won't use it now. You can, this could be on or off or whatever. I, I'll show my pictures in a second. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And um, uh, from, I'm supposed to speak from the CSO or NGO perspective. And of course I can't speak for all NGOs, all environmental NGOs. I can speak for SNC. and c uh, And of course we are pushing for a deal in Paris that is bringing very, very quick changes, that is bringing a shift from a global economy based on fossil fuels to one that is based on renewable energy and helps vulnerable people and communities uh, with the climate impacts. But in the same way, we're of course very aware that the deal will not be that ambitious. And, um, we too want to avoid the Copenhagen scenario. Because of course it's very frustrating that still very many issues are unresolved uh, <coughs> and um, that the core in many of, many of the discussions still is about a fair deal, who is going, uh, who will be the forerunner, who will take responsibility, mitigation, finance, that, uh, what is it, 10 million uh, US dollars every minute spent on dirty energy, while the 100 billion US dollars uh, per year is really, really hard to find to help poor, poor countries with adaptation and mitigation. And, um, of course, it's very frustrating that what the pledges we have will lead to at least three to four degrees above prehistoric times. Anyway, as I said, we want to avoid a, climate, a Copenhagen scenario because, as Anna mentioned, it was, it was horrible for, for the NGO community as well. Not only the result that we were disappointed, but the expectations were, as you know, enormous. And we noticed at SNC, we noticed in the world that the NGO community just shrunk, you know, the mobilization was massive and then it was just this total disappointment. And uh, you can see on all graphs we have that engagement really dropped after Copenhagen. And we really want to avoid that because that's not gaining anyone and no, no process in the future. Uh, so what we've been discussing now is 
How do we communicate before Paris and after Paris? As, I mean, as, as I said, we know that the deal will not be as ambitious as we want to and as many people in this room want to. But we still need to communicate in a way that uh, we say this, we need a radical agreement, but still don't make people very disappointed afterwards. So should we communicate disappointment relating to what is really needed, or should we communicate success relating to what is possible? And some of you others have mentioned this, and um, it's a question very relevant for us. So uh, in Sweden, we have decided to do a positive mes message before Paris. We want to say that many people really see that this is possible and that someone said this is the new normal i think it was you and uh, our campaign from essence and see it's uh, let me see if this does it work we'll see. yeah there we go. it's klimat maxa and this is a campaign that uh, involves a lot of people and involves ordinary people. We've asked uh, people to do, to support us and to tell politicians that uh, everything is possible or this is possible. We can achieve enormously a lot, a lot of, of things just by knowing that it is, po it is possible. And um, uh, these are pictures, we've just started this campaign there are loads of people around doing this access, and that's the support. They do it on Instagram and uh, send it to us, and uh, we've been touring around to take pictures as well. Um, because um, I think I, I do get the feeling that still in the climate negotiations on a global level, there is still this notion that, uh, even though it's changing, that uh, the last country that is stuck or still still in the <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> can recognize some people <laughs> anyway um, that the notion that uh, the last country that is uh, still in the climate uh, the, the fossil economy is the winner but of course that is not the case of course it's the case that many as you mentioned municipalities companies have realized that maybe it's not very cheap just this today to go for a renewable economy, but of course it's the pro most profitable thing to do in the long run. Yeah, there are many examples. California was mentioned, Freiburg, Bogota, Seattle, Copenhagen, Malmö, London, and also businesses. Here in Sweden you have the Haga initiative that is uh, gathering a lot of big companies, pushing for close to zero emissions by 2030 in Sweden. That is much, that's the same as we're saying at SSNC. So we are, we, will, we are trying to convey a positive message, to convey that municipalities, businesses, and loads of people want to see this happening. There's just, it's really, really possible, and uh, try to push politicians in Paris to uh, make radical decisions with this in there, as a hope. Thank you very much. You want to maybe? <laughs> Thank you very much. I haven't seen myself out, and I know I did this ex last summer. Oh, what, you, what you picture there? I didn't. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh my. So. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Johanna. One thing that is really interesting, as you said, you know, the expectations were extremely high, as you say, not just among the CSOs, but but in, in you know among pe public yeah. public in general, at least in in Europe, not least, and, and northern Europe. And then it sort of fell through a little bit in, in Copenhagen. Um, isn't there a risk somewhere that expectations are too high? That, you know, because we have heard so many times, both this morning but also in the afternoon, that we should have high but realistic expectations. There I am. Yes. High but realistic expectations. Yeah. Don't you sometimes raise expectations too much? Well, I think that was what happened in... Uh Copenhagen. So how do you try to, what, do you tell people now? How do you tell yeah, people yes, now? Exactly. I mean, that's, that's, a, tricky, that's a tricky thing. Yeah. Because um, I think what we want to say is that uh, Paris is sort of the floor. Yeah. And then it's loads of examples in the world, municipalities, businesses, 
people just you know pulling the mm. floor upwards and that these cycles we're now talking about that uh, we have we get a global deal that is okay includes all countries and then that we can do the uh, reviews every whatever fifth year mm. uh, to push it forward but uh, not uh, not to talk about Paris as the now or never. Okay, because that, that's still sometimes heard. So it's interesting that you say that. You say that let's get a good agreement in place that provides the basic floor and then we can actually ha increase the ambition. Yeah, there. I think mm. so. I think that's at least how we, we think that it's best for us to communicate. Okay. But maybe we want to scream, you know, it's now or never. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> can, you, can you join us now, everyone, at the table here? Um, and we turn off, yes, thank you. Is it off now? Yeah. I think it's off now, yeah. so people won't see any more excess here. No, you get the picture. Please take a seat. Any tweets? Uh, not so much. Do you have a preference? Do you have a preference? So, uh, in a second, I will let the audience come in and, and we can start to ask questions. And just to give you the style, uh, I hope... Uh, what I will do is to allow a number of comments and questions and then I'll let you reflect on them. Uh, you can select a little bit, but if you try to avoid the question, I will detect it and then push you a little bit in that direction anyway. <laughs> Maybe, uh, Laurence, if I can still you know, start with a, a short question to you, because you gave your presentation, um, you, you then we heard um, input, and Anna, of course, also represents government. Then we also heard a little bit from the scientific community, if we can call it that, from the CSO community, how the expectations and how we like to engage with the, with the Paris negotiations. What, from your perspective, how important is it in terms of the negotiations to actually have other actors like the scientific community, CSO, businesses, supporting or trying to influ influence negotiations? What, what is the best role they can play in order to support, you could say, the Paris meeting? <clears throat> I think for what I heard, it was very clear that if we share the vision that Paris is, you calls at the floor, I see the starting point, and then we build on that, then I think uh, we can really use all the energy coming from the mobilization of so many different actors in, a, in the projection to the future, and not just like to crash because we cannot get what we dream of. <clears throat> and I don't know where we will land, but in, in, any, anyway, whatever, wherever we land with the agreement, if we can <clears throat> crystallize and capture all this energy and transform it for the future, mm. uh, and, and, and at least and really fight for that every element to, trans to this transformation is in there, I think then the message of Paris will be the message of change. And that, in different, with different terms, different words, we hear that all, all, all for, anyway, from, from Michel or from from all you two. So uh, that's what is so important. It's like not a lobby that wants to get something. It's like organizing a force to go further. And this force is independent. A local authorities' action and NGO action is independent from the government. They will not stop because the government failed or succeed. They will go on. But then you create the synergy, which was maybe not there or maybe has to be increased. So. I think, um, you, you know, there is a two uh, ideas of demonstration in Paris. One would be on the 29th of November, and uh, there is a plan to have one on the following morning, on the 12th of December. And, and if this goes well, this demonstration of the 12th of December is to look for the future. It's a celebration. 
celebration, but not <laughs> celebration we are happy. Uh, what, what do we do now? Yeah. What, what is, because that's the important thing. Whatever we can celebrate in Paris, and I would be happy, if, of course, if we have a success and etc. And as Laurent Fabius says many times, if everything goes well, it will be Hollande, uh, be, because of Hollande uh, capacity. If it fails, it's because of Laurent's uh, failure. <laughs> so um, I know that. So of course I have a vested interest in somehow we call something a success. But Really, that's not that important. The importance is just to crystallize the energy and we say, yes, we win something, it's a first step, and we are not under, with a depression of Copenhagen, at the contrary, we have with a lot of energy to go forward. Mm. And uh, that can be very different for, because we expected to Copenhagen to solve things. If we expect Paris to start things, and not because only of government, but because the local authority will be there, the business will be serious, and not again greenwashing and insist on that, and etc. So that's, I think, uh, that's why then the pressure is absolutely fantastically positive, mm. whatever form it takes. That's excellent. It's because it's, it is, of course, uh, in a way, as you say, key that we balance between, again, the expectation and what is realistic, and the, what is realistic in terms of the negotiations. And that shouldn't prevent us, of course, from doing much more than whatever the results are there. In terms of the interaction between politics and, and science, if I can just ask a quick follow-up to you, Kenneth, as well, because we actually here, and we are in the house of, of the Academy of Sciences, but, and in Sweden, we have, not least, we've had a, quite a, some discussions about you know, how much should science, scientists, be engaged in politics and trying to influence Politics. I'm sure that it might be similar in, in France and elsewhere. In the US, we have at least a perception, and, and looking at your organization, that scientists are becoming at least more and more involved in politics in many ways. Um, is that perception true? And, and can you see any risks uh, there in, in terms of, for instance, looking at the climate change negotiations and, and the role of scientists? I think that's a great question. Um, I think scientists are getting mobilized in the United States. They are speaking up. Um, but one thing that is frustrating to some of us, but it's a reality, is we in the United States are a very uh, tribalistic country. And most people <laughs> uh, read a certain amount, certain newspapers that confirm to what they believe. Um, and they, they don't really listen to other people. So what we, we have found is the best way to use scientists is to use them on a local level. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole network of scientists across the country, and if we go in to meet with a senator or a congressman, we have someone from the district who's, a t who's teaching at a college that that person respects. In other words, sometimes the messenger, who that person is and whether they relate to that audience, is much more important than the scientific information mm -hmm. they have. Um, to the other question you asked, is there a risk? Th there is a risk, and at least at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we have scientists who talk about the science of climate change, and we have economists and policy people who talk about what's the best route to decarbonize, and we try to keep those separate um, because we want to protect the integrity of the science and separate it from the policy. Okay, that's an interesting. Thank you very much. Let me get some you know, feedback and questions in from, from the audience. We will have an Microphone, please wait for the microphone. It comes here. When you get it, you introduce yourself yep. and you can give a comment, statement, or, or a question, but it should still be rather short. Please. Okay, thank you. Enos Fredin, Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, I, first of all, it's really interesting afternoon. Uh, and if it's true, the vibration of some optimism. Uh, is felt, and that is of absolute necessity, of course, after the Copenhagen frame. The question is then, what is it that is the basis for this semi-optimism or whatever? Uh, is it correct assessment? And what are the elements? So three aspects, and you could find some other also. Is it that the public at large has gotten tired of sort of counterforces and so there is a more what you could call transformation preparedness in the general one possible another one which has been uh, talked about uh, are the price curves of the new technology 
and that it was quicker and the prices were better uh, on the solar and wind and whatever. So there would be a transformation of the technology transition in cost terms. Or is it this act of groupings, uh, the mayors and uh, partially groupings of uh, new couplings between business uh, um, types of actors or the California case or whatever. So those were only three suggestive type of, you could say, checkpoints. Mm. Maybe there are other checkpoints, so please. Are these true or not true, or just hopings, or are there others? Thank you. It's a very, very good question. And of course, there are certain linkages if you can demonstrate, <laughs> thanks to technology, whatever it is, that it becomes cheaper and not so difficult. We tend to become more, you know, open to change, maybe. Is there another one over here? Yes, please. We have here. Uh, there will be a mi microphone coming here. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Doreen Stabinski, I'm visiting professor of climate change leadership at Uppsala University. And um, I, I guess my, my question is directed to Ambassador Tubiana. Um, so we're being led to understand that the deal won't be very ambitious. And, and when I think about that phrase, I think principally about mitigation. Um, mm -hmm. Is the deal going to be ambitious on finance? Um, What's it going to look like on finance? And I, I, I mean, the mitigation, not having ambition in mitigation, I think is maybe easier for developing countries to sit with than a deal that's not ambitious on finance. And I wonder if you could talk not just about what, what the finance outcome might look like, but also what the politics of finance are with, within the negotiations and, and how that may or may not sort of sweeten or, or allow for a, a deal at, at the end of, of our two weeks in Paris. Thank you very much. Also a very good question and links a little bit to the early discussion about finance for development and, and the relationships potentially between these as well. Uh, any additional input at this point? You had, we had, yes, we have one here. And then I take you as the first in the next round, okay? So Mons Lernroth, please. Thanks, my name is Mons Lernroth. Uh, I have a question for Laurence. Uh, as I understand it, you, you want to shift from targets to pathways. And the, um, the linch, linchpin, in a sense, in pathways is expectations. And expectations not of the outcome of the Paris meeting, but expectations of all the diverse actors around local authorities, companies, whoever, whatever. And I'd like, I'd like you to expand somewhat on how you see these expectations are changing and how you expect them mm. to change over the coming years. Thank you. Excellent. Very good question. Uh, Laurence, I'll let you think a little bit because there were two questions directed to you and maybe take the first more open question about the positive drive uh, that we can see. And first of all, would, can, I mean, just with a raise of hands, the panel, would you say that there is a positive feeling now, you know, moving to Paris? How many would agree with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, they all agree on that. So now the question is, coming back to you, why is that so? So, Michel, please. Uh, maybe just a couple of elements. Um, I just want, don't want to monopolize uh, the floor, but I think well, t technology evolution is obviously very important, but at the same time, I think it's not maybe not the main driver. I think it's an important psychological driver for a number of people. What, what has happened on the, on the solar, et cetera, et cetera, uh, convinced a number of people that certainly something is possible. But at the same time, I remember uh, a discussion with the Minister uh, of uh, Environment of Germany very recently, who was saying, well, the problem we have in Germany is not that we have failed the development of renewables, it's that we have failed the closure of the coal mm -hmm. power plants. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, it's not because we have technologies that we are solving that problem. Technologies is an opportunity, but it doesn't, it, it's, not, it's far from sufficient to solving the problem. And we know that it, without other drivers, the technology will solve nothing. I mean, uh, we've improved efficiency, etc., uh, and the economy works in such a way that we just take technologies to develop. So there are other drivers, and I, I would just mention two. I think one of them that relates to the issue of grouping. I think that we have a much clearer view uh, today of the connection between the 
uh, climate agenda and, and uh, the agenda of development, the agenda of socio-economic uh, satisfaction of our needs, etc. Uh, this is becoming very concrete. Uh, remember, for instance, last year when there was the, 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 the football uh, thing in, in Brazil, World Cup in Brazil, uh, everybody was on strikes, etc. What, what, what were these people mm. asking for? They were asking for cities with public services. They were asking for the basic uh, social services in these countries and saying we don't need football, we need transportation, etc., etc. Mm. This is precisely the same agenda we are addressing with climate. I, I think these things are, very, are, are becoming real. Um, and, and certainly it's very important because it's no more about is development first or is it's first a development agenda of development agenda of environment, etc. I'm not making things easy. Uh, somebody said, well, it's very difficult in the countries. We need to deal all this. There are budgetary constraints. There are assets, etc., uh, etc. Et but we, we know how to integrate. And so we are no more discussing climate policies, but we are... I think discussing uh, how we can proceed with development, etc., integrating this on a very concrete manner. And I think this is, this is important. And the last part I would mention is um, I think we are, uh, we are understanding better what, what it is about also between the top and, uh, and, and the bottom to some extent. We have all these local authorities, private sectors, NGOs, citizens taking action, etc., etc. What's the role of, of governments into this? And to a certain extent, I think the role of government is not to define everything and define the rules and make all the deals, etc., but it's really to change the, the, the issue of risk. Uh, and for the time being, the risk is still on the innovators. Mm. It's still more risky to be an innovator than to proceed with the classical way of investing, dealing with money, making decisions, etc., etc. And I think the, the optimistic way of looking at things is that an agreement in Paris would be able to shift progressively the risk from the previous normal to this new normal. And supporting these people, these innovators, etc., in their way of looking forward, and shifting the risk to the others, to the traditional way of thinking, to the traditional way of investing, etc. And we see this happening already uh, in the financial sector, who is starting to have a different appraisal of the value of investments, um, not just because of the risk of climate, but also of the policy risk that uh, some assets may uh, incorporate, etc. Et mm. And I think this is a very important uh, aspect that a lot of people out there are looking at all these issues from a point of view of risk. People in the, in, the, in the finance sector do not bother if it's about climate or not climate, if it's uh, about the renewable, if it's coal industry, etc., etc. They are agnostic to some extent, but they are starting to have a very close look, I think, at the, uh, at the way we develop. So partly the optimism uh, can be derived from the fact that there is there's a better understanding uh, among a lot of different actors today about uh, you know, the possibilities for investment, the fact that this is not sort of a separate issue from development, it's actually something which is fully integrated into it's development. So solutions are there. It's also something that makes things complicated. Yeah. Uh, it's clear that when countries, for instance, are, are, are doing their first INDCs, they are discovering the whole complexity of, of this transition. Mm -hmm. While in Kyoto, for instance, it looks sim very simple because, I mean, it was about reducing yeah. gases. Reducing gases That's is something very, you know, uh, virtual, and we can agree on, on, uh, on reducing gases. So I think we, we are at a very interesting moment where things are becoming very concrete, real. Uh, so actors are confronting, we have controversies, we have discussions. It's not making things easier, but I think it's making things possible. Mm. Johanna, I mean, you, you, uh, just before I let you come in, Anna, you, you also raised your hand. So despite the fact that you, you had some kind of um, depression after Paris uh, from, from the CSO society, you are optimistic again. Um, what, what is the reason for that optimism uh, among sort of your constituency and the fact, I mean, you're 230,000 members here, but also in CSO community in a wider sense. Is it a realistic optimism or are you just gearing up again? and the risk is very high that, that uh, you, know, you will crash. Mm. I think it's reason? actually both, to be mm. honest. Um, but we really, we really want to, to tell our members and uh, I mean, the engaged citizens that it's, uh, it's, imp it's an important, important meeting and that um, 
we really need this deal. And uh, for it to happen, we need to say that there is a chance that it will be a good deal. So that's part of, of the, the truth, I think. But I also think that there is a big chance that there is, I mean, just the fact that China and US are on board, mm. both of them, there will be a deal. But then, of course, how good will it be? And I think there is now an accept acceptance that the floor or the starting point or what have you, that uh, the now or never approach, it's sort of, um, it's not discussed in that way, mm. uh, as, as I can feel mm. it. Just to, just to one, one follow-up, I mean, what we've heard many times in the recent couple of years, we saw it this morning in the seminar, it's this drive from the private sector. We say it's very important. Corporations are on board. You said that many U.S. Uh, companies are on board. We know that not just in the U.S., by the way, I, elsewhere. There are other companies who are not still <laughs> on board, depending a little bit on the sector. From the CSO perspective, um, is this just positive? as you see it, the fact that uh, the corporate sector is uh, more and more engaged, you can say? Or do you see risks? Well, I think uh, mostly it's positive. Of course, everything that is done is positive, I think. Mm -hmm. But, of course, it's, uh, there's a risk that uh, if, if you put too much responsibility in the lap of, of businesses and, and countries step back mm. and think that well, it's been, been taken care of by someone else that is not in the negotiating room. So, of course, that's a risk, and uh, you put too much belief in that someone else will solve it. Mm. Uh, that's a risk with other actors stepping in if governments step back. Yeah. Anna, you, you wanted to comment on this question as well. Yes, I think it, it's very interesting because I think it's a, it's a resp responsibility of all of us, and I think it's very encouraging that faith communities are coming forward. It might be, not be so important for, for Swedes that the Pope is uh, issuing an encyclical because we're not very religious, we're a very secular society. But I think it's hugely important for, mm. for the rest of the world. And, and it's an important signal. And I think we, we, need, um, we need to move towards more of also a philosophical uh, discussion. I mean, what makes us happy? It, it doesn't make us happy to to go to Thailand uh, twice a year. It doesn't make us happy to, to, to consume. It doesn't necessarily make us happy to, to eat meat. I mean, things like that that are, so we can actually have a better life, uh, but while we reduce our emissions. I think we need, that's the kind of discussion we need to have. And I think it's very encouraging that you have so many members, but we still have, a, I think we've been moving towards a very, individualistic society in Sweden over the last few years. Mm. Uh, and, and that is something that mm. we, we could work on without finger pointing too much. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a tricky balance. Can I, because uh, Laurence will, will also ask, answer the questions related to the director, but, but also on the finance uh, issue, because you are also part, I mean, you are representing Sweden in the formula. Do you have any comments on, on that particular aspect uh, as well? It will, it will be one of the, the, the crucial outcomes, I think. Uh, from the Swedish government and, and Sweden as a whole, we, we believe in setting an example, both in, on climate action, uh, domestically and abroad, and, and not least on finance. And I think it's, very, it's, a, it's been a very good si signal that we've uh, made the biggest per capita pledge to the Green Climate Fund. This mm -hmm. is symbolically very important, although it's, it, it isn't the biggest uh, overall uh, pledge, but it's the biggest per capita pledge. And we saw that uh, during the autumn, that when we came up with our pledge, we actually pushed other countries uh, to follow suit. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a, uh, we get this ball rolling. But one additional point that I, I, I like to make on, on when it comes to finance, that we also need to recognize what's going on in the South-South cooperation. Mm. And it's not just about developed countries uh, providing finance. I think that's, that's very important because it's part of our commitment, uh, part of our previous commitment, and part of our moral responsibility and solidarity. Solidarity with, with those who suffer and, and, and are more vulnerable, but also for, for our self-interest. I mean, we have an interest in mm. other countries taking climate action because it benefits all of us. Uh, but also the South-South cooperation, because there's a lot going on. I mean, uh, take the, the new South-South cooperation fund setting, being set up in China. in China. That will be hugely important, and probably much more important than what's going on under the mm. uh, Green Climate Fund. And 
and, and to, to bring that together somehow and recognize it and work together. Mm -hmm. It comes back to the question of coherence, as you also brought up in your presentation. In the end, if we start to see a plethora of different funds, different mechanisms and so on coming up. Uh, Laurence, over to you. Um, <coughs> on, on the first question of that, uh, what makes the, the optimism, where does it come from? <coughs> I will take an, an, all your points in a way that Preparedness of transformation, it's, but it's not only public, as uh, Michel Colombier said, is a government prepared, preparedness, which is really unprecedented. Um, now it's sort of a, I, I was describing the Chinese uh, context where in December 2009, the low carbon strategies that EU was putting forward was considered as a really a threat by China. And then uh, two or three months after, they began to work very, very seriously at that. And now it's a totally embedded mm. concept with them. And this is coming in. Uh, we had an informal um, consultation in Paris with head of delegation uh, in May. And we had this uh, long discussion on decarbonization pathways. It was the first time, I am in this since too much time, it was the first time we could engage in a discussion where we had a, a quite candid discussion, some countries saying, I don't want to hear about decarbonization as I am a country like uh, Venezuela living from fossil fuel. Uh, I can consider low carbon, but not deep decarbonization. We had a discussion on pathways, but really a real discussion. It was not again a minus 5% or minus 10 or minus whatever. It was a, a concrete thing. And uh, so I think the preparedness is helping a lot. Um, and I would say that um, as well, this, of course, this, I would not phrase only technology, but this uh, opportunity. We, we, know what, uh, pa we know part of the solution, not all, not all for two degrees mm. C, clearly it's quite far away, but uh, we know most of what is needed and we know how to do that. And that, I think, is changing the, the picture. Coming back to the outcome, I would not agree with you with a low ambition on mitigation, really not. Uh, but just say, uh, I think it's very ambitious to have a mechanism that where all countries commit to present mitigation plan when all means all. When all means including developing countries, including, even if they are not obliged to, but they will do, less developed countries. It's not so much for the quantity of the emission reduction, which is that important, but it is a concept that everybody would look at it. Everybody would look at it and not like before saying we need to increase emission and then we'll see, mm. which was the actual mode of the negotiation, but we have to consider seriously if we can reduce and when, meaning Again, not think about reducing, but mean about what do we do in sectors, specific sectors, how much we can do more public transport, how much we can have uh, um, uh, efficiency in buildings, how much we can do urban planning. Is that, I think that really on the substantive part is absolutely unprecedented. This is very ambitious. So I would not say it is not ambitious on the mitigation side. It is very ambitious, but it cannot be done overnight. It cannot be uh, uh, one step and the, res the solution is here. I cannot even anticipate how ch ch China is a central piece of all this, huh? isn't it, as US. How you can ask China to know precisely and commit to which is what we need in we would like to be ambitious in the classical in the classical meaning. How we can ask China to be sure what the Chinese economy would look like in 2050, compatible with the two degree C, and know what it is about? They can have a sense. They can have an idea. They can see what is needed, what does it take to do immediately to have a chance to get there. But they cannot describe the precise pathway and commit to it for 2050. So, and if they want to consider putting this before 2020, which mm. they are prepared to do. I think it's very ambitious. But of course, that's why, and, and I'm sorry if I, I, I send a message, uh, it will not be a very ambitious agreement. It is a very ambitious, but it, is, it doesn't look like what we are accustomed to look for in the agreement. F bindingness, that's not something that really, it's, for me, it's a misunderstood, totally misunderstood. What does it mean by legally binding? 
and we have uh, famous professors of environment governance here in the room. Uh, is it about, uh, um, so what does it mean really to say it's not ambitious because the numbers are not in the, agreement, in the legally binding agreement? What is a compliance mechanism uh, beyond uh, measuring, reporting, and verification we had in international treaties? Aside from WTO, and WTO is about trade dispute. Mm. It's not about sanction. It's about do you agree together if you, something is, is going wrong between you and you settle the dispute. That's something. It is not sanction. On the rest, we don't have any guns to force anybody to comply with this commitment. And that's true for, I would say, for, for the ones who are there, the immense majority of, uh, of uh, international treaties. Even uh, nuclear proliferation doesn't do that. Huh? You can use sanction, it doesn't work very well, by the way. Anyway, so what I think is, this agreement is very ambitious, but you have to consider in a different way. But I mean, it cannot solve everything at, uh, in, in one step. Mm. So that's why it's a starting point. Doesn't mean that it's not ambitious, but you cannot ask an international treaty between government to change the whole, the whole economy. That's not realistic. That's not real. Fortunately, if it was, you can have an agreement that changed the whole economy, would be all of, us, all of us out on the street crying, mm. because that would not be even close to anything democratic. So I feel, so I feel it is an ambitious agreement because it encompass everybody, make a first step where we have to be serious is about the clarity of the rules and the implementation of these rules. On finance, what we can do on finance? We can do, first, what I think Anna has, has, has said, we have to mobilize more public funding and we have to have a more intelligent discussion of about finance. Mm. Finance has to be in line with sustainable development objective. Uh, it, I think we cannot have this intelligent discussion if we don't add more public funding mm. because we will not even open the door of the conversation in Addis Ababa, for example. But then we have to see how this public money, which is small compared to whatever is needed, to really have uh, access to capital markets at a really very reasonable cost or very, very low cost for some of the countries who need it. And I think that is possible. Again, it will not be delivered totally by Paris, but we will have a very important element, in particular engagement of the, of the banks who are really uh, taking, over, taking a large share of the risk for the private capital to come in, and for even for the national capital as well as the international capital, I think that will be, if we can get this ecosystem right, we'll have done a huge job in Paris. And I'm thinking, I think we can do a lot before Paris to do that. So that's the way I respond to the finance ambition. It's not in terms of numbers, because the numbers are really very big. We have to mobilize after 2020. Uh, but it's a sense of how the, we, we, we create mechanism where not only China can get access to a capital market, mm. but Mali or Burkina Faso or Ethiopia. That the, that's the one. And they are asking for a lot. Ethiopia is asking for 200 billion to do its uh, carbon neutrality because they want to export electricity to the whole region. Mm. And that's good. Well, so that's the money we have to find, by the way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think, I mean, it's an interesting point, though, uh, Laurence, that what you're saying, it's an ambitious agenda, they, we, you know, you're looking for very ambitious commitments in a way, but they look a bit different from what we have said in, yeah. in the past. And I think, coming back also to you, Johanna, in terms of communication, this can be very, very critical mm -hmm. to actually you know, you could say, make people understand that even if we don't have clear numbers, 40%, 50%, or 30%, it can still be an ambitious agenda. And it, that, there we have a challenge, no doubt. I mean, to have a global agenda where all countries commit vis-a-vis -vis having an agenda where a few countries would put very clear targets uh, that would maybe appear as more ambitious. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting also, Lawrence, when you talk about finance and mobilizing public finance, because one aspect is, of course, also making sure that the investments we will see, in that, and that's the whole new climate economy story, of course, in energy infrastructure, in city development, in, in agriculture, etc., investments that will take place regardless of climate or not, 
how we can impact and how we can influence that investment. And of course, in the new climate economy, they point out that 90 trillion dollar up to 2030. Mm. So mm. the 100 billion dollars in the climate, green climate fund, it becomes nothing. Mm. I read an interesting article in, in, uh, in, a, in an Indian newspaper, uh, I think it was New Delhi uh, Daily or something like that, just pointing out that with current trends, the urban population of India will grow by 400 million people up to 2050. So in 35 years, it's like building all existing U.S. cities and more even, because it's more than the U.S. population. So we have to think, building Chicago, New York, Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, whatever, up to 2050, in 35 years. Hopefully not the same. Ah, you yeah. see. No. And that's the thing, hopefully not in the same way. Mm. And that's what we are trying to say. I'm going to bring in a couple of others, and then you can comment on the previous, and so it becomes like a dialogue, so please. Thank you, uh, Anders Tiresson, uh, coming from the Ministry of Environment and, en and Energy. I have a past in the climate change negotiations and uh, in particular perhaps uh, Copenhagen where I participated and uh, I think it's true uh, what, I, what you have been talking about and an analyzing right now, the sense of optimism that we have right now. And uh, I, I agree what, uh, you have, your, with your explanations, etc. It's clear that uh, at the bottom of it all is uh, an, an increasing sense of, of that it's possible, that it's doable. Uh, and this is changing the whole pattern, it's changing the instructions of the negotiators, it's uh, changing the, 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 the uh, definitions of, of the national interests, uh, etc., etc. So this is extremely and profoundly important, I think. At this time around, uh, before Copenhagen, we were becoming worried, I remember. Uh, and uh, uh, the response to, to this uh, urgency, the sense of urgency, was basically to uh, enhance the expectations. Mm. And I Good think this, is, this was the dynamics that we had. Uh, the more worried we got, the, the higher the expectations raised, etc. But there is another, well, uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, a question uh, in regard to this. Um, what we had, uh, what was typical for the climate change negotiations was the, the need for kind of burden sharing. Very much of the, the discussions mm. was about burden sharing. I, I haven't heard you talk about burden sharing today, uh, I think. Not much, at least. So my question is really, is this because that the, the concept of burden sharing is actually fading away? So that was uh, one, one issue. Uh, the other uh, one of my f favorite topics is, is the, the enemy of the climate change negotiations, the complexity. Uh, they are complex because they are digging down into the toolbox, mm. really. It's not a formative process, but basically it's a, a process about tools, how, how to do it, actually. So, so therefore it has to be a complex. And you can see what the, 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 the negotiating rounds have been characterized by walking from a very general stage like uh, the climate change in, uh, convention in 92 down to a very com complex, uh, detailed treaty like the Marrakesh. So you can see one round of negotiations uh, encompassing 10, uh, encompassing a decade, going from generality to something very detailed. And now we're there again. Very, uh, something very general came out of, of, of uh, Copenhagen, uh, the, the accords. And uh, of course, my question is now, where are we in Paris uh, uh, down the road? I mean, are, are, we, are we reaching the end result uh, or are we on, on the way somewhere? And, and in this context, of course, and this is perhaps my, my, my most important question, where do we have the two degree target? I mean, everybody's talking about uh, uh, and, and, and acknowledging today that uh, Paris will not mm. deliver the result that is necessary to reach the two-degree target. So uh, then, of course, we need some kind of process, and hopefully Paris will deliver that process that will make it possible for the parties to go, go further after Paris. And, and how will this mechanism look like, in your view? Okay, thank you. Uh, on the final one, it's in, important. We have heard about this is a path we are entering. 
we need some kind of monitoring mechanism. We need to be able to every five years or something. Well, you know, so describe that a little bit from the terms of the negotiation. Is this really on the agenda? It would be nice and interesting to hear. Any other points or inputs at this? Or I yes, please. Um, the recent IPCC report. Can you introduce yourself, also? Uh, David Silverstein. Uh, talk about a carbon budget, how much we can consume before we exceed two degrees C. Um, however, there's some recent scientific um, facts that have been coming out on what's happening in the cryosphere, uh, particularly in Antarctica. There's some um, ice sheets that are starting to break down. West they think irreversibly. And also in, in um, the north, there's uh, emissions that are possible both CO2 and methane emissions from the uh, permafrost, which supposedly holds more than about twice the content of what's currently in the atmosphere. So it seems that this notion of a carbon budget may in fact be optimistic or could potentially be a moving target and shrinking. Mm. And I wonder about these IDC INDCs. We, we had something similar with um, Copenhagen and, and um, Cancun with the pledges, and the pledges resulted in, in you know, a large emissions gap. Um, and it seems that maybe the question isn't to see or not to see, but can we avoid runaway climate change or not? And that's a different level of urgency than what we're currently pursuing. Um, and it seems negotiations they will, they, they achieved a somewhat level. We got somewhere, but we didn't maybe get far enough. Um, and it seems maybe the INDCs aren't a strong enough mechanism to prevent um, reaching uh, a, a point where it might be runaway climate change. Because at that point, when the positive feedback kicks in, we may not have any control anymore. Okay. So I'm wondering, well, carbon pricing is a, can be a powerful instrument. For example, you could have a carbon price that increases until the cost of removal of the atmosphere. And in that case, let's say by 2050, you have a carbon price that increments until the removal of the at until, until that cost. We don't know what that cost is, but we could estimate <clears throat> it and have a trajectory, a trajectory towards that. Wouldn't that be a, a, a bit <coughs> firmer um, mechanism than just based basing it on kind of shame of INDCs and using the economics from the bottom up as well. Okay, thank you very much. So two specific questions. Anyone who wants to start on this? Uh, Michelle, you want? Yes. <coughs> yes, on, 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 I mean, those questions are very much related one, one, one to the other. I think there's a figure we didn't discuss uh, much uh, that was mentioned by Laurence is the, the idea of having cycles in this discussion. Um, it, it's clear that the outcome of Paris will not be ambitious enough in terms of figures, and we know this already. I mean, mm. when, when we sum up the INDCs, we are far from what is needed. We have a gap to, to what, 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 whatever budget we have for the moment, and I agree with you, this budget may change in the future. There is a gap. Um, and, and the idea is to say that um, if we look at these INDCs at the same time, they are not at all business as usual. You commented the US INDC, uh, which is not business as usual. It's not, it's not what the US used to do. Uh, it's something, it's something mm -hmm. different. Uh, it's new legislation. Uh, if we look at what the, the China is preparing, it's not business as usual. So there is movement. And the question is how we can accelerate that movement. Because what, what will matter for the climate at the end of the day is not the figures that are inscribed in the Paris decision, it's the actual emission to 2030. And so th there should be two agendas uh, after Paris, the day after Paris. One is an agenda of implementation. People need to implement what they have put in their NDCs. And at the same time, we need to have a parallel agenda of revising what's in the INDCs and trying to be more ambitious. Because INDCs have been prepared before Paris. INDCs have been prepared before we had these rules, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So we, we, we need to, I think, just uh, out of Paris to start a new cycle of, of discussion, not 
not to discuss 2050 objectives, but even to discuss the 2030, the evolution of that pathway. So it's a complete change compared with what we had in negotiation until now. Until now, we had an agreement in Kyoto, for instance, for 2012, and then we wait a couple of years mm. before 2012 to negotiate 2020. Is this possible? Well, it's precisely what happened with Copenhagen. If, if you look at the US agreement, the US commitment, and the Chinese commitment to, to, to Copenhagen, both countries are over, I mean, you will not overachieve by 2020 in the US, it will be a bit difficult, but what is announced by the US and seriously for 2025 is a change of pace compared with what was announced right. in Copenhagen. And doubling the pathway. In China, China will, in, in, the, in, the, in the forthcoming five years plan, will overachieve what was promised in Copenhagen. So it means that these five years from Copenhagen to now have been used by these two countries also to learn and be more ambitious. Mm. This is what we need to build, I think, at the, at the global level. And so the, 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 the idea of, of, of burden sharing, well, I, I mentioned this in, in the presentation, I think uh, it's too late to discuss burden sharing. Burden sharing was something that we could discuss in the 80s when we had time and so the, the issue was, we need to reduce a bit, who should reduce? The issue today is the issue of radical transformation of all economies. So the question is, we, we need to drive our own uh, economy on the basis of what's needed for our country to achieve this objective at mid-century. At mid so it's no more about burden sharing. And if you want to achieve whatever close to two degrees, it's, it's, it's not the issue anymore. Um, and in the INDCs, we say fair and ambitious. I think the, the, we, we need, maybe not yet exactly like this in Paris, but one day we, we need to consider that an INDC that is fair and ambitious is an INDC that proves that what the country is undertaking is completely compatible with the fact that this country will be decarbonized mm. by 2050. And this should be fair and ambitious at mm. least. Mm. Not sufficient, because then fair and ambitious means also I'm able to help other countries that don't have the same capacity. Now carbon pricing. Well, we have a big discussion in France uh, currently on carbon pricing because a number of economists say, uh, well, this is far too complicated and it would be much easier if you had a carbon price. Um, yeah, but getting an agreement on a carbon price may take 50 years. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible. And I think that eventually what this negotiation aimed at is also building progressively carbon prices uh, in, in the world, in the different economies. Now, certainly we don't need the same carbon price in India and in Europe today, or not in all the sectors. If you want people in India, the people that are still using coal or charcoal or whatever, to pay a carbon price at 120 euro, as you have here in this country, I think it's clear why it cannot, it, it cannot work in the negotiation. Then for some international sectors, maybe, mm. maybe it makes sense. And maybe this is something that we can build progressively out of Paris. But we cannot negotiate a common carbon price in, in, in a discussion like this. This is, I think, uh, this is the best way to completely uh, never uh, achieve two degree or three degree or whatever, because we cannot make this agreement at a global level. So what you're saying, it really is, we have to be very pragmatic in a way. And, and it has to be very much adapted to the national capacities. We, we, we need to be pragmatic and we need to consider that the carbon price is a way to drive a transition yeah. in an economy and it's not necessarily the same everywhere in no. the economy. We know this. Uh, we know that, this, for instance, there is a sequence also of action that is needed. And if you want to... Uh, we, we've taken 30 years in France, for yeah. instance, to develop the fast train uh, network and it, or to develop a metro or something like this. It takes, it takes decades. And if you, if you look at the price of carbon that would make this just on an economic basis, that would, make this, that would drive such a decision, it's mm. a high carbon price. If you look at all the social mm. interests, et cetera, of doing this, it's a different thing. But if you just compare the cost of infrastructure, et cetera, you would need a high carbon price. If you wait 2040 that your carbon price is riding to make that decision, it's too late. Mm. So we need another agenda also for a lot of different decisions from the day-to-day -day decision, the equipment, et cetera, and infrastructure and city design, mm. et cetera. Kenneth? Carbon price is one tool. Kenneth? I, I thought that was a great question, and I, I share your answer. I, I would just, on the, on the issue of carbon pricing, I, I would say that um, if 
In the United States, if we're to reach an agreement, it probably will um, include a significant component of carbon pricing because in the United States, and polling shows this, people's views about the science of climate change depend upon what they think the solution is. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people don't accept the science of climate change because they think it means inevitably a lot of government regulation that they're predisposed to be against. And what we are finding in private behind the scenes discussions is there's actually a lot of support in Congress for a carbon tax, especially if it were tied in to an overall tax reform and certain uh, refunds of, or re reductions of corporate tax increase. There'd be a way to get there in the United States. <coughs> so I do think that's going to be important. The <coughs> one thing that gives me some pause about a carbon tax, though, is I think to get it done in the United States, we'd have to give up a lot of other things that are actually working. And it always worries me to give up something that's working in exchange for an economic model that sort of tells me if a tax is at a certain rate, we're going to get reductions, but it doesn't actually guarantee it. So I think it's a valuable tool. It probably is going to be part of a United States solution, but I don't see it as, as a panacea either. Mm. And now you had a comment. Can I, can I add it? I mean, we've been having a carbon tax in Sweden since 1991, and it's one of the it was one of the first in the world, and it's one of the highest in the world. And it's, I mean, there was an outcry in the beginning, but people, and of course, when we raise uh, uh, prices on, on, yeah. on, uh, on, on, on petrol, it's, 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 not a, it's not a popular measure, but it's, it's been working quite well. And it's an efficient way of uh, transforming your economy. Uh, but of course, you cannot implement a carbon ta tax in Saudi Arabia today. It's just impossible. And you can part of the social contract. So I think you have to implement... Uh, uh, different solutions in different places, but I think you can build islands of, of carbon taxes, and and you, I mean, you already have a lot of or islets of. I mean, you have uh, more or less functioning carbon um, trade emission schemes, uh, mm. and then you have a lot of pilots. And I think as you as you, I mean, over the years, you will probably uh, to an increasing extent connect these these schemes and and. And, and, I, and I think if we get a, an ambitious outcome in, in, in Paris, that will also give a signal towards uh, a development of carbon pricing. We know that, I mean, even oil companies ask for a carbon price, so we know that it's, an, it's something that, that, is, that is wanted, but not in the same way in different parts of the world. But when you say that, I mean, for me, you know, if I'm just a normal citizen then, uh, which I am, uh, listening to you say, well, if you know, ambitions, an ambitions uh, agreement in Paris will give us a signal that carbon, that sounds sort it of... It sounds vague. Yeah. It sounds a bit vague, yeah. yes. So what do you mean by that? I mean, is it completely impossible and not even counterproductive to have an agreement being a bit tougher on that, saying that by, you know, by 2020 at least all former Annex 1 or whatever countries should have a carbon tax in place? Is that counterproductive today? Is it really about, you know, saying these are the ambitions, these are a lot of tools that you can use, please go ahead? I, I don't think it's counterproductive. I think it's, it's not really realistic. Okay. I, I, we are working on, um, uh, we're part of this group, grouping called Fen Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform, and we're working on a, on a communique. There is a draft communique, and we're, we're trying to, to uh, incentivize countries to to support that communique. So it's initiatives like that. We might have declarations, we might have uh, initiatives, but I don't think it's realistic to commit to a carbon tax that all developed countries in Paris commit to a carbon mm. tax. I'm not saying this would be counterproductive, but I don't think it's realistic. Johanna, would, would the civil society be happy with an agreement saying that uh, we are sending a signal to countries that they should consider carbon taxing, taxes or carbon pricing? Is that ambitious from your perspective? Yeah, well, it's really good if, if that is a signal from, from the negotiations, definitely. I mean, it's been successful, but now we have problems with the EU yeah, regler, whatever that is in English. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's uh, becoming quite ineffective. But anyway, um, I, want, I wanted to say something else, sure. if it's okay. I was, I was uh, curious about the burden sharing. Uh, is it really true that it is not an issue? Isn't it that it shouldn't be an issue? I mean, you said that it isn't an issue anymore. It's about now how to the transformation should happen. Is that really in the heart of all country 
negotiators. I mean, I still get the feeling that there is uh, a belief that you're 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 still a loser if you. Mm. Uh, I mean, you, it's better to stay in the carbon economy a little while longer than to leave it first. Mm. If you see what I mean. Or I, I mean, I agree with you that that should it should be the case, but is it really the case that it's no discussion about? Uh, um, what is it, a burden of sharing? Uh, do you see what I'm asking? I think that, yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, you feel it, of course, in the discussion. Uh, some are, and, and it's de de depending on the groups, no? Uh, you take this uh, group of ILAC countries. They decided that they were on the other side, that finally uh, the low carbon economy perspective mm. was the way to go, and they want to go there. So they want ambitious mitigation targets, they want strong rules, they want to go there. And so they are, uh, for them, the carbon, the burden sharing is, is not a way out. They, they, don't, they don't see that. Others are not confident, uh, or because they would like to keep uh, using the fossil fuel more, because they are producing and exporting, typically uh, the case for many for fossil fuel-based economies. Others uh, don't know exactly what does it mean for them, uh, or, or countries like India who said we need more to emit more because we emit not enough. And, but they are kept in this discussion or on one side they say that and on the other side they would like to be uh, the new technology uh, countries that develop renewable energy being the first investors. Mm. So you're totally right. We, we are still on the, on the balance there. Uh, the, the sentiment from developing countries that it's good to say others would lead is still there, uh, and, and because we want to know what is low carbon economy, I do, do show us. Mm -hmm. But it's second, because they are not, some are not so sure that to quit this posture uh, <coughs> will, will make them win something. And, but I feel we are exactly at that stage, and maybe by Paris we will have somehow a mixed result on that, or some countries would seek think into uh, winners and losers on that aspect. But many of them, again, the case of Ethiopia is very interesting. Uh, less developed countries, less than, I think, less than 20% uh, having mm. access to electricity. Um, certainly, it's a sort of a central planning country, a tradition of a very, very strong government, maybe too strong sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and they feel that they can, they can be the exporter of geothermal and uh, solar electricity and hydro for the whole region. So they see them, and they are very poor, as a new power mm. in 15 year times. And they, then they change totally the perspective because, in a way, they have a project. And Kenya is a little bit in this situation, but some countries doesn't have a project, so they don't see how to do that. And the more we, we can bring, or that's a domestic discussion mainly, have a vision of the project they can have for their country, that will change. So again, if they have no project, it's better to stay where we are. So the past dependency is there on the position. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I think, this burden sharing, but it is fading, it's more, it's more like ideological. In reality, countries are super pragmatic that we will not find a solution in burden sharing. That's not, that's not possible. There is no formula. Uh, everyone wants to keep the two degrees C, even 1.5. Alba countries want 1.5. So what does it mean in terms of, you know, even if uh, the emission of the developed countries would go negative, you, you still cannot. So. I think this burden sharing is like more an ideological, a political element more than uh, the pragmatic solution that we'll have at the end game. Uh, nevertheless, on the carbon pricing, I think what we will see is uh, many countries using uh, uh, elements of carbon pricing in their INDCs. I agree with you, that will not be enough, huh? we need more. Uh, but that will be uh, one step. I think if we can do that, we will try to push one institution or the other to try to evaluate what is the implicit or explicit carbon price that these contributions are, in a way, uh, creating. And I think it will be no null. It's not been null, it's levels. 
The second element is what Anna was referring to. We, it's good to try to get coalitions and maybe to open. Uh, there is many countries and companies that have signed up for the carbon price. That's fair. That's good. I, on the company side, and maybe that the message I send them very, very regularly. It's good to to condition. It's good to say we you you want a carbon price. I don't think you can condition every action to the carbon price because that's the best way to wait for very, very long. To have an international carbon price with a clear trajectory mm. for this, okay, you can, you can wait some 20 years more to get it, or maybe 10 years, I'm too pessimistic. But that, so that, it should not be a sort of catch-22 thing. I think um, we have to push more, we have to, uh, but again, if it's a tax, a tax is related to a particular political economy in a country and a domestic discussion. Mm. That's why you can have a carbon tax in the US, but just don't, never imagine to have an international carbon tax mm. imposed on the US. Or just Japan. imagine that, or Japan or whoever. Even no. even EU, we cannot agree on a tax system that is... Of course, tax is about citizenship and constituencies and voting. So that's why I think a carbon price has to be related with a domestic context anyway. For international trade, I think we can open the discussion after Paris. I think it will be open anyway, because we need that. And, uh, but that a very specific arena and area where we have to discuss that. And we will have, we'll see, for good or for bad, depending on the quality of it, some kind of link, linking between the different carbon markets because of these trading elements. Thank you very much. So we are actually having a reception waiting for us. And I think that a few of you start to feel that <gasps> it's time for reception now. Yeah, exactly. um, it's been a very interesting panel discussion. Uh, the, the sort of the method we have in the Gordon Goodman is to actually have a panel having a chance to actually you know, speak a little bit more openly and not just short uh, interventions. And I think you have uh, really managed to do so and provide a lot of different thoughts. It's clear for Paris that we, there are reasons for optimism. We have said that many times. There are very, a lot of interesting pros, progress being made. How the agreement will look like is, is something that is quite open. Uh, we should possibly expect something looking a bit different from what we've seen in the past. Not less ambitious, but maybe a bit different, maybe a bit more open, more inclusive, and, and really trying to get all countries on board. If this is, is going to be enough or not, that is another question, but of course what you have also stated, one thing that will also be important is not just to see at the agreement in Paris in December, but also what Paris actually sets in motion in terms of taking us forward. We are not at the end uh, of the story, that's, that's for sure, but we are hopefully making a very very, very good midpoint or whatever up to 2030 when we, when we hopefully are really on track for a decarbonized society, even hopefully bringing in the today producing, oil producing countries and others. So, so, so thank you very much for providing all these uh, deep insights from different perspectives. I'm going to hand over to Bo Chilean to close today's seminar with a few remarks in the end as well before the panel, or before the reception, but I would like to give you a warm applaud from us. And make it loud now, even though we're not that many. So, you know, you know yeah, that's the way. Thank you. So, boom, please. You can take Thank you very much, you um, and... Um, I think you made a beautiful uh, summary of this uh, very interesting panel discussion and I won't try to in any way to um, uh, repeat that. Let me just say that um, uh, having gone, gone through all these phases of the climate negotiations since the first negotiation of the convention, uh, I'm struck by this uh, sense of optimism. And I feel that it is uh, an optimism which derives not just because Ambassador Tubiana set the uh, atmosphere and set, set the stage by uh, saying that uh, there are many positive elements. I think that it is, on the whole, a different uh, type of preparation for a conference of parties than we have ever had. And it is due 
to a certain extent, of course, to the good work of, of the French uh, presidency here, I'm, I, these, uh, these points that have been made are all highly relevant. And um, I think we can be grateful that we have had this kind of preparation, which is on its way, which is not sure. I realized in Bonn that uh, many things are still open. But there is another thing to me, and that is I don't think we have ever had a preparation for a conference of parties like we have had now. And that preparation started with Copenhagen. It started with an understanding of the situation that came through uh, after the sense of being a, at an absolute hopeless situation. Well, when you have reached the bottom, you are all the time going up then. And therefore, I feel that what has happened is that climate change has come into a broader framework than the uh, normal dabbling in the, in the negotiations. I know that that will continue, that the negotiations show that it is difficult to make more than 100 countries, almost 200, agree on something which is so important. But there has been two things, I think. One is that we have had a much longer, longer preparation than for Copenhagen and it has been accelerating, if I use that expression. What has happened in, in Copenhagen, then in, in, uh, uh, in, in Cancun, Durban, uh, Doha, and so on, and, and now most recently in Lima, is something that everybody is prepared for Copenhagen in a different way. But at the same time, things have happened in the real world. We have seen how the uh, energy revolution is getting into speed. We have seen, and it has been mentioned here, about the reality of energy prices, what is happening there. And it seems to me that all the process here is really getting the impression from this real world. And at the same time, we get indications like uh, the mention here of the papal encyclica. Other uh, furnishers of values and ideas are coming in than before. And I feel extremely strongly that we are in a different situation than before in the negotiations and that this will appear here. I, I believe that there is an acceleration of change and not just a fuite en avant, uh, as we are here. We have a sense of direction and that uh, the feeling is that it is the old style action, and for instance, and also the old style uh, sources of energy that are beginning to lose out and that the future lies with the new. And once that shift starts to accelerate, Lots of things will happen. And I believe that what we have heard here today has been an indication of all this and giving us a sense of that direction, which is uh, very helpful for all of us, it seems to me. And uh, I must say that uh, the feeling is really that you should not just sit like this, but you should do it like this. <laughs> and the world is on its way, and uh, the climate change <laughs> negotiations, I think, are contributing to that largely. And I thank the French uh, coming chairmanship for what they have achieved. I thank uh, you, Laurence, you are one of the centerpieces here. And I know that uh, Ambassador Lapouge uh, has also been, and he still is, in this uh, 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 drive for a result. And that's why I feel that we are very fortunate here in Sweden to have a, a Gordon Goodman Memorial Lecture of this quality and of this direction. 
uh, and at the same time as we have started a really good cooperation with the French Embassy and with France. Merci beaucoup.